So I think uh, the, the two minutes are up um, and I think we'll get started at this point and we'll wait for folks to sort of trickle in over the next few minutes. Um, so just to give you a, a quick welcome, my name is Ben Hartley. I am a uh, principal specialist working on energy efficiency and cooling at Sustainable Energy for All. Um, we uh, have been working, I guess, as an organization on this topic of access to sustainable cooling for I think probably about six years now. And um, it's the coming up this year in, uh, in 2023, we see an, um, a particularly important sort of moment leading up to a COP28, which we hope to make a cool COP28. Um, so we're very grateful that you're here with us for this session and grateful for partnership with uh, the ADB uh, for putting this on because it's, uh, it's a pretty important moment for cooling and we think this is a fairly important discussion to be having. So, you know, I think you can all appreciate that in a warming world, um, access to sustainable cooling is a key sort of climate mitigation point. Energy demand is rising and to meet that demand, we're gonna need sustainable energy systems so that we, we ensure that our, our systems both on and off grid can support rising cooling needs. But at the same time, cooling is also emerging as a very important equity issue and an issue of climate change adaptation um, that we can see. Heat stress is now, in 2019, it was estimated that heat stress killed over 350,000 people. Um, that was a number that about five years before was estimated to be 12,000. So the, the knowledge about this topic is really going, really going up and it's an important sort of point here. Um, so yeah, uh, just to summarize very quickly, so in partnership with the Asian Development Bank, the UK Government Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, and the COOL Coalition, this session is going to highlight regional leadership on sustainable cooling policy, innovation, finance, and technology across the region, and provide a forum for uh, participants to shape and learn more about the forthcoming uh, Global Cooling Pledge that is being championed by the COP presidency uh, in the UAE. So to give you a very quick sense of it, uh, the first half of this is gonna be a, l a long session. I hope you'll stick with us through the whole afternoon. Um, from two to 3.30, we'll have an opening as well as a session on technology and business model innovation for sustainable cooling that will be led by the UK Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. And in the second half, um, the session will focus on the global country leadership on policy and the global cooling pledge. So um, with that, um, I would like to turn the floor over um, now to Dr. Nam, uh, Dr. Ki Yung Nam, uh, Principal Energy Economist, Asian Development Bank, to provide opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ben. This forum should be supposed to be paper, paper free, and then everything we turned out to be digital, you know, digitalization and then this mobile app, but the thing is due to the, you know, several things that I had to carry one print out, so I'm sorry about that. So anyway, so it is, uh, welcome all you this afternoon, clean energy partners I call, because this is meant to be the clean energy forum, so we see all our partners as uh, clean energy partners, distinguished speakers and all the participants here who are audience as well. So we welcome you all. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, you all to the ADB and this ASAF and to this deep dive workshop on regional leadership on sustainable cooling and the COP28 Global Cooling Pledge. Over the last five years, there has been a considerable progress in sustainable cooling that ADB is also part of it contributed both in terms of a policy related to performance standards and in the development of innovative new technologies and business models that can make the sustainable cooling more accessible to people living in cities as well as in the rural areas. Yet delivering access to the sustainable cooling remains a complex challenge that we see from the ADB side as well. And as uh, 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 Ben was mentioning, energy demand for cooling continues to grow substantially, posing threats to our energy systems and our objective to mitigate the impacts of the climate change. As heat, in heat increases due to global warming, it is also triggering substantial risks to human safety, causing increased mortality, great food losses, which we are expecting even more now, 
and challenging the delivery of our health services, such as the vaccination distribution, vaccine distribution, among others. This underscores how uh, vital sustainable cooling is in people's lives, that it is in service that must also be equitable provided to all if we are to achieve SDG goal seven. Cooling needs come in a variety of, in forms, variety of forms. The need for comfort and safety in the home and workplaces, this is how normally if it's, one talks about the sustainable cooling, then they, everybody think it's just only the air conditioning system in the residential area in the office. But not only that, it's a pre uh, food preservation and nutrition as well as the health care and in different solutions are required to meet them. To address these needs, it is therefore imperative that we consider sustainable cooling as a complex concern, concern that must be viewed from the system perspective. So meaning that it is economic terminology, in fact, what we are looking at as a cooling itself to as a cooling, cooling solution, then it has to, we have to undertake the system approach in the economic term that, you know, because it is, while you know, we have to look at it more on the integrated s system as a whole, you know, as the cooling itself. If we look at only the cooling technology in one aspect, that will not solve any of the issues because we have to look at the backward and forward link linkages as well. So when we contemplate uh, on a system approach, it is important to think holistically and leverage all the available resources and tools to effectively reduce the need for cooling and the energy demand goals that come, uh, that could come with it. This means uh, looking not only on technology per se, which, you know, time to time, Deep Dive Workshop is organized for the certain technologies, but, you know, what we try to come out with at the end of the day, you know, everything has to come out with it. Technology is one side, but also under the political aspects and the institutional framework, as well as the, you know, from the demand side as well, efficiency and everything we have to look at. So, but also we have to look at other business models, services and policy tools that can deliver and make efficient cooling solutions more affordable and available to all. The ADB, you know, I, I, I've been explained to some of you already how we are involved in this, which is a part of the, uh, our new energy policy, which was approved in 2021, explicitly also include the cooling and heating and sustainable cooling is one of the areas that, you know, that we are looking at in particular from the South Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia perspective, including the Pacific as well. And we see the sustainable cooling as a critical component of its energy access because it's still lacking. And we are, ADB is looking at not only the sustainable cooling, but also the cooking as well, access, and climate goals. In the last five years, because we didn't do much of the implementation of the cooling earlier, but you know, since the five, last five, five years that we are looking at more closely on that and we are trying to contribute as much as possible from, you know, through the technical assistance program at the moment. And ADB has supported various clean cooking, uh, uh, clean cooling initiative to address the specific needs. So just a couple of uh, examples that we would like to share is that currently, uh, let me go from the uh, before one. So we are looking at so cooling. We have conducted a one pilot projects under the technical assistance project that we implemented a pilot project, which is the featuring a, a so to say grid tied solar PV called the storage system with a net metering arrangement with a local utility. That is the one that which we have implemented and, and that was inaugurated in the northern side, side of Manila. So in the Philippines, I don't know the name. I cannot pro huh? Yes, I cannot pronounce, but that is the, we have inaugurated and that was uh, quite a good with uh, different types of business model. And this project is supported, uh, suppose the objective of that project was the agriculture sector, to support the agriculture sector and provide the sustainable cold storage solution for high value crops and vegetables in, in that area, <laughs> which enabled actually for the small farmers to have control over the marketing of their products 
and avoid some kind of a post-harvest losses from that side. And another one, which is the pilot testing, which we are doing, we are in, in, in the process of implementing in Sri Lanka, which is the slightly different, what is that this is the kind of uh, uh, pilot project which has a ventilation and air conditioning system, retrofit and greenfield installation, which is in Sri Lanka. How we do it is we have three public buildings, which includes one hospital as well. So, you know, what we do is we deploy there. It's a practically, it is the centralized air conditioning system. We convert it to the more, through the smart system to be more energy efficient on one side. And then we are also adding the, uh, uh, adding the filter system, special filter system, which covers the PM 0 0.5, so not PM you know, 10 or PM 2.5, is, is the filter so that you know, it also uh, controls over the, so to say, the, any of the airborne diseases to cover that. So we are in progress. And we are hoping that that will be inaugurated, completed by end of this year. So these are the kind of some examples that we are coming out with the technical assistance program, not only the study, but also the, you know, we are conducting the pilot projects as well. So this is, a, so, you know, uh, this, this is a session which Ben was explaining and how I asked, uh, summarized the was, you know, it will showcase some of the cool sector across the technologies and business model that we would like to also ADB staff should be here also and then learn how we can really replicate these technologies in the ADB portfolio and maybe we can also scale up that thing, uh, the projects as well. And you know, I was discussing with us one of your colleagues uh, from the partners and then we discussed that maybe this is also possible that you know, we can also introduce somewhere in Bangladesh where we're also looking at very much of the, this type of things. Initially, the pilot projects we wanted to introduce in Bangladesh, not in Sri Lanka, in fact. But the thing is, you know, there are all other countries that you know, we would like to uh, implement some of the pilot projects as well. And second, this workshop will also showcase a significant policy progress on sustainable cooling from leading countries in the region, which we should also learn and then how we can, because we have a different modality of the investment. One is the policy-based lending. Yesterday, somebody talked about the uh, results-based lending type of the modality that they were talking about. It. So we have a different types of the modality and which fits what, you know, so. And thirdly, it will pose a challenge through the global cooling pledge being in, championed by the UAE COP28 presidency to commit to further advanced policy progress and financing for sustainable cooling globally. So ADB is also part participating in one of this, uh, you know, and we'll see how much that we do. So in sum, I would like to, we would like to thank for all the partners, as if all, Hong Peng is not here, but UNSCAP, UNEP, Coal Coalition, and then UK government for making this event possible and putting together, to putting together the panel of experts, you know, who can share their knowledge and experience with us. And we look forward to your vibrant interaction and hope that the forum will positively contribute to attaining our common goal of providing sustainable cooling access for all. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you. Great, hopefully this, this works. Um, well, thanks everyone for making the, the long trek over from the auditorium area and for the post-lunch uh, lull, we'll try and keep it as lively as possible to, uh, to keep everyone awake and halfway through uh, the ASAF week. Um, so this, uh, this first session, I'm going to do a bit of a, an overview first from the UK government perspective, uh, which hopefully you can see on the slides behind. But then we're going to go into the first session on innovation uh, and from a technology and business model uh, perspective. And I'll introduce the panelists um, after this quick overview uh, from me. Um, it says on the time I have 45 minutes. I don't think I need 45 minutes for my presentation. Um, I'll only need hopefully eight minutes. Um, but I will try and calculate it as best I can. Uh, thanks, clicker. That's great. <laughs> that would help. 
Okay, so now am I pointing it to the back or I'm pointing it to you? <laughs> there we go, that explains it. Do I get an extra 30 seconds then? Because of the <laughs> Okay, let's see if that works. Can I remember my slides from heart? <laughs> that's, the, that's the backup plan. There we go. Um, so I thought what I'd do is just give you a bit of an overview um, of the UK's international climate finance for sustainable cooling in the region. Um, I'll give you a bit of a big picture perspective first of the UK government's um, international climate finance, and then I'll bring that down from that very high level to a very specific case study so you can see how that flows down to, uh, to the ground. And we've got some exciting new work as well that I'll talk about. Um, so a very, very text-heavy slide, but these slides will be available for you um, after, you know, on the, on the ASEF website. So if you're interested in any of the programs that we've got that support sustainable cooling in the region, um, have a look at more detail at this slide. I'm not going to meticulously go over every single uh, text on here, but just to give you the big picture, um, we have a number of um, programs that look at sustainable cooling from different perspectives. So we have some that look at the cooling access issue, some that look at how do you cut the costs down, um, others that look at mitigation and how do you accelerate the commercialization of new innovative cooling technologies um, in Asia Pacific, uh, but also we, we look at other regions of the world uh, as well. So we have um, a clean energy innovation facility, which we're going to talk more about, um, which has uh, some of its delivery through, through the Asian Development Bank. Um, we've got a new Accelerate to Demonstrate facility that I'm also going to talk about. Uh, and then there's three more which I'm not going to talk about, um, but happy to, to uh, speak afterwards. Um, the bottom three on here focus more on very specific targeted programs. So we've got one on cooling appliances, which also covers uh, a number of uh, countries, particularly in South Asia and Southeast Asia, a transforming energy access program, uh, which, as the title suggests, focuses on things like cooling access, but clean um, cooking as well more broadly. And you may have heard some of the interventions in, the, in, in other sessions on, on that topic. Um, and then one looking at sustainable cold chains uh, as well. But I won't go into too much detail because two of those I want to come back to. Um, so we're looking a lot at our international climate finance in the context of how it can sort of really link and support some of the global initiatives. So we see quite a lot of push um, now to try and get, you know, cooling up the agenda. And it's great that uh, it's going to be in COP28 uh, uh, this year as, as, a, as a hot topic. And, you know, the next session, session two, uh, which Ben's going to be uh, leading, and we'll get some of your views on that, uh, on the, the Global Cooling Pledge as well, and how we can uh, sort of push this up the agenda. But there are a lot of um, wider initiatives out there. You, you may know Mission Innovation. This was a global initiative going back to, I think it was 2015, if I can remember correctly, uh, looking at clean energy, RD&D, and how do you accelerate in key areas. So although there isn't a cooling-specific um, mission, there is something called the Affordable Heating and Cooling in Buildings, uh, mission, which has been going for a good five, six years now, and trying to see what we can do in, in the building sector uh, on cooling. We're also quite active on the Montreal Protocol. How do you phase down sort of F gases in cooling equipment uh, as well? And we've got some international climate finance uh, programs that do look at that particular uh, area as well. Um, we also have a, a buildings, a green construction program delivered through the IFC, the International Finance Corporation. Um, and that one is really trying to see how can we um, not just decarbonize uh, construction, but also the cooling that's needed, um, particularly in hot countries. Uh, so that one actually mainly focuses, I think, on Southeast Asia, that program. So I wanted to just quickly cover a commitment that basically is, is our sort of future for the way we're thinking about a number of our international climate finance programs. So with this one, um, it looks at uh, clean energy uh, research, development, demonstration. We see that as a, as a big gap as well in the cooling space, and that's why we wanted to dedicate a whole uh, session uh, today on innovation. Um, so really, how do you accelerate some of these and scale up some of these really innovative technologies that we're seeing in the region? And you're going to hear from uh, two innovators on our panel about some of the, um, the enablers and, and challenges uh, that they've faced as well in trying to sort of scale uh, these technologies. So we're really looking through that lens for some of our uh, climate finance. So it's a one billion pound uh, commitment under our 11.6 billion total international climate finance. So it's a good chunk of money, um, and it covers all the programs I mentioned before, plus a whole other suite of programs as well, and new programs uh, that we're developing. Um, so we're looking across the whole innovation chain for this. 
So if you look at cooling as an example, um, you have programs that are trying to look at the earlier stage part of the chain. So that's the research development, university lab testing. The bit that I personally work a bit more on, which is that valley of death in the middle, which is where you've got after the university stage, but you're not quite at that scaling of these uh, technologies. Um, and then we've got some later stage programs looking at innovative financing mechanisms, things like advanced market commitments, green public procurement approaches, um, you know, patent buyout types of uh, financing mechanisms. And these are really interesting models that haven't really been hugely tested in the cooling space to date. Um, there, there's been quite specific um, approaches that we've seen. You might have joined the energy efficiency session yesterday or the day before, um, where there was a speaker talking about India's work on um, green public procurement approaches. So they're very interesting approaches for this area, but there's also other ones that we want to look at uh, as well. Um, so these are the programs. Some of these I mentioned in the slide before. Um, but if you're interested to get more details, um, yeah, talk to me after. Uh, I probably won't go through this in a lot of detail. But how we're looking at delivering this £1 billion commitment is uh, focusing quite a lot on the themes. I don't know if it's got a buzzer. Yeah, it does. Um, we're looking at things like sustainable cooling as a, as a key focus of this. We see this as a big challenge. Uh, we're also looking at things like smart energy. So we were talking in the digitalization session the other day. Uh, clean hydrogen, storage, critical minerals, uh, as well as a really um, sort of a, an, up, an up and coming sort of topic. And we've got a new, a whole new program that's just been set up, uh, which was launched last month, um, focusing on the critical minerals issue. So I want to go from the high level to the low level, and I'm trying to do the maths on the time on the clock now. <laughs> so I think that's six minutes, uh, if I've done the maths correctly. Um, so that's all big picture. How do we now bring it down to the ground? So I'm going to go to the mid-level now. I'm going to take one program as a case study so you get a sense of what it actually does in practice. So the Clean Energy Innovation Facility, this is a 15, 50 million pound program. It's got one fund that looks dedicated to innovation in sustainable cooling. That's delivered through the International Finance Corporation. Um, and my next slide talks a bit more about that. Um, you can see some of the high-level impacts here, the numbers of projects supported. Um, we're also lucky enough to have one of our innovators in the room that's been supported uh, through this program, who you'll hear from um, a bit later. So just to take that cooling fund down to the next level, so I'm trying to get down more towards the ground here. Um, we've supported about 48 projects so far. A lot of these are pilot testing projects going into countries. And we've got an active pipeline in India, but also in other regions like in Colombia and Mexico, for example. We had a cities program. In India, it's a lot more on the coal chain side and the hospitality sector. Uh, as well. Um, you see on here some of the results we've had, so in terms of things like how many of those projects have actually scaled. We're quite fortunate in actually the delivery model has been quite effective. 75% um, have started to scale. If you look at uh, analysis, for example, from the IEA, 50% is pretty standard in innovation across clean energy. 50% of projects scaling others failing. That's, that's actually even 50% is quite high. So we're quite lucky that actually the model that the IFC uses, which is called the Tech Emerge program, um, has managed to scale um, three quarters of those projects, which is fantastic. Um, other sort of impacts um, in terms of private finance leveraged as well has been quite high in that fund. So about 45 million pounds, which is about roughly $56 million uh, conversion. Um, and that's from um, just under 15 million pounds, so that's quite, we think that's quite a good uh, leveraging rate. So let's go down to the next level, which is let's take one of the projects supported by there so you get a sense of what does this actually mean in practice. Um, so just to take one project in India that we've supported, this has looked at coal chains, it's looked at actually pilot testing and switching um, to uh, bio-based um, uh, and natural refrigerants uh, technologies as well. So this is piloting for coal chain um, switches as well. Um, it also did have a bit, you'll see at the bottom of the slide as well, on, on life cycle emissions. So part of these projects are also looking at data. So underlying data is also a barrier. So not just testing the technologies, but actually being able to build that data infrastructure to enable some of these technologies uh, to be piloted um, as well. I think I have 30 seconds left. Is that right? <laughs> OK. So. It's th th 30 seconds. Um, the panelists will know that this is how I'm going to keep time on the panel. So I <laughs> can't keep myself on time then, though. That's also not good. Very last slide. Um, it's a new program. So just to you know, raise the visibility of it, it's called the Accelerate to Demonstrate Facility, £65 million. 
It was uh, launched by our PM at COP27, but more formally launched sort of last month, so it's very recent, delivered by the UN's Industrial Development Organization. Um, it covers a whole range of things, but cooling is one of the, the areas of focus. Uh, so again, looking at how do you accelerate um, commercialization of tech in that valley of death. So if you look at things like technology readiness levels, three to seven, that sort of range is what it, it focuses on. And it also does other things like focus on critical minerals, clean hydrogen, and some of the other um, big topics that you might have heard about at ASEF to date. So with that, I think that was my last slide. Um, so now we can move on to uh, session one's sort of panel discussion. Um, so it would be great if our uh, panelists uh, could, could come up to the stage, and I'll introduce you as you're coming up. Um, so it's great that we've got um, representatives from the innovation industry, from financiers and government. Um, so firstly, um, Dr. Beta Parameter, who is um, from Cool Roofs uh, Indonesia, if you're happy to come up to the, the stage. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ms. Diane Mahajan, who's the Chief of Innovation Staff uh, in the Philippines government's uh, National Economic and Development Authority. Uh, Dr. Prasanna Rao uh, Donchola, who's from uh, one of the, the innovators we've supported through the cooling program I mentioned. Uh, so thank you for, very much for, for joining us today. Uh, Ms. Maraida Santos Lissario, who's from GIZ, which is the, the German development agency, very active in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then finally, uh, Ms. Clemencia uh, Torres de Mais. Uh, I can say it, I can say it, I know how to say it. M Mes Mesle. Yes. Uh, I've been practicing that this morning, um, from the World Bank's Energy Sector Management Assistance Program, which is very active on the cooling space, got lots of finance in there. So thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, I think we've got 40 minutes, have we, for the, just to double check. I'll use this from now on, yeah? Great, uh, fantastic. So for the panelists, um, we've got a series of questions that I'm gonna start off with and then we'll open up for Q&A. Now I've heard that in this room, they don't use the app. So I know you might have been using the app for if you were in the auditorium rooms, but apparently for this room, it's all gonna be through the live um, speaker that's, that's coming around on the mic. So just to flag, it may not work if you post a question, but uh, later on do definitely come in because we wanna make this as interactive uh, as possible. So I'm first going to ask each of the panelists just to, sorry, you probably couldn't hear me, I just realized. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to move a bit, so I'll try not to <laughs> move too much. Um, I'm going to first ask each of the panelists just to introduce themselves a bit more, more broadly about their role and what they're doing in either the cooling or innovation space. Um, and also just to first cover what they see as uh, the top two enabling uh, factors for either cooling innovations or, or innovations uh, in, in this area as well. So we want to start on the positive. Let's get the opportunities uh, and enabling factors before we start talking about some of the challenges as well. Um, so if it's okay, we, I'd like to go uh, down the line if that's, if that's okay. So start so with Clemencia from the, the World Bank. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Clemencia Torres de Mestre. I work in the ESMA program, which is the, uh, the Energy Sector Management Assist Technical Assistance Program in the World Bank. And uh, the objective, we, the, basically the objective of what we do, which I think is what you want me first to explain, is that we work in many areas that have to do with energy in terms of getting the development impact, meaning access and efficiency, and also the decarbonization and the cleaner transition towards uh, cleaner energy. So we always work, if you want, with those two legs. And in that context, in this map, we are, I would say, kind of a think tank within the World Bank, but we are, we focus on different things, and I think that that defines what cooling is. Cooling goes across sectors. So we work across sectors from health, agriculture, urban, and other areas that are may missing, but we, fishery. We work from the pure knowledge dissemination, knowledge creation, to the support to pilots, and to the investment part and the way we do that is that our funds leverage 
the operations of the team in the World Bank. So we, the, the global part is a public good for all of us, with partners, with clients, uh, without any attachment, everything is free and public. And in terms of influencing and leveraging the operations, we work through the World Bank. And we are last, we cover all the regions, in particular we are active in Asia and, and, and the Pacific. And um, we do that by different programs, which I outlined, you, you stop me if I go too, too, too long. But essentially, first we have what we call is the ESMA program in which we give grants, grants that leverage uh, also investment in the World Bank and in the case of in the case of Asia, for instance, we have programs that go uh, in, in, um, in Bangladesh, in India with digital heating, and also uh, in several other places with space cooling. So that is one way in which we contribute. We also have a, a GCF fund that is specialized in nine countries where the, uh, the Characteristic is that it has technical assistance, but also millions and in investment for cooling. So nine countries, and there are among those nine countries, uh, several in Sri Lanka, for instance, is one of them, and in, uh, in, in other countries in Asia. Those are in preparation, and the objective is to demonstrate at scale what can be done. So in Asia, specifically, the countries that are included are Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, where they will be in an average, say, between 30 and 40 millions of this program that, that will leverage hundreds of millions of IDA or World Bank money, but with the additional that it includes uh, investment. This is the second way that we do that. Uh, when we work with the general fund of ESMAP, for instance, we cover several sectors. And in health, an example, we work on Pacific Islands, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos. These are grants of technical assistance that then will be complemented by operation of the World Bank in obviously millions of dollars. Uh, in environment, we work in Malaysia, Fisheries, we have one case in the Pacific Island. In buildings, Indonesia and Mongolia, China and Malaysia in terms of urban. So that gives you a, a sense. Then we also work at another, uh, in another area or in another instrument, which is with uh, the focus on uh, specifically the Montreal Protocol. You might not need to move on to neighbors, but that's okay, just okay. for the time. So I close and last which we will go come back later, uh, with the incubators and the pilots that you have started through IFC. And there we have several programs that I will come back. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marai Delisario. I'm from the Philippines. But for today, I will be representing the GIZ Global Cooling Program, ProClima. So basically, ProClima is a, um, a, a program based in Germany, which was developed in 1995 within the, comp uh, within the context of the Montreal Protocol. So I will move on. So in 1995, the German government has its contributions to the Montreal Protocol in supporting Article 5 countries or developing countries in order to implement their phase-out schedules of chlorofluorocarbons and other uh, controlled substances uh, covered by the uh, multilateral agreement. However, for the ProClima program, we are since its inception in 1995, we are promoting the use of an integrated ozone and climate approach. It is not just a matter of looking at phasing out chemicals, but we also have to consider its impacts, both to the ozone layer and also to the uh, climate and environment as well, because we also focus on projects supporting occupational health and safety of technicians and other uh, public health concerns related to the phase out or phase down schedule. So the ProClima program has been implemented with more than, has implemented more than 300 projects uh, in around 40 partner countries. So all of these are 
within the um, funded by the multilateral fund of the Montreal Protocol, which is based on the contribution of the Federal Republic of Germany. So we operate in the context of compliance mechanisms. So if a country decides to go for both uh, climate-friendly technologies as part of its phase-out schedule, Proclima can develop a uh, project, uh, a project concept that focuses on measuring, reporting, and verification of both the uh, ozone impacts and also the climate impacts of these projects. So with funding from BMZ, the Technical uh, Cooperation Agency of uh, the German government, the International Climate Initiative of the Environment Ministry of Germany, we also do projects funded by the European Union all of them integrated ozone and climate approach, so we always choose the most climate-friendly technology. So it's not a matter of uh, choosing a specific type of technology. The technology has to be assessed in terms of its climate impacts. So we support countries by conducting greenhouse gas inventories uh, for all uh, refrigeration and air conditioning subsectors. So the subsectors of refrigeration and air conditioning is unitary air conditioners, chillers, uh, domestic refrigeration, transport refrigeration, mobile refrigeration, and of course the cold chain. So in the Philippines, we are very specific in supporting the um, regulated products under the Philippine Energy Labeling Program. And we're also supporting the Philippines in conducting the uh, calculations for a more ambitious NDC in its next update. So we are also implementing MLF projects in India, China, Papua New Guinea, but we are implementing climate projects in Southeast Asia. So there are three major projects in Southeast Asia, Cool Contributions Fighting Climate Change, Green Cooling Initiative, and our newest project, which covers both um, the life cycle of refrigeration and air conditioning equipment which is the Climate and Ozone Protection Alliance. So our approach, we, we have a three-pronged approach in implementing cooling pro projects. First, we have to do a technical advisory, which is rooted in conducting a transparent a greenhouse gas inventory of the sector. So we have conducted greenhouse gas inventories for the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, so this is based on a tier two approach of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it is, uh, the experience we have is this is a totally different approach from the Montreal Protocol, with this, which is just the total number, the total volume of refrigerants multiplied by the quantity. We also perform capacity development activities. So we train technicians refrigeration and air conditioning technicians in order for them to adapt to the changes in technology in refrigeration and air conditioning. So we are also focusing on a just transition to green cooling and also a climate friendly refrigeration and air conditioning sector. Finally, we do technology transfer, working with the other implementing agencies of the Montreal Prot Protocol, like UNIDO, UNDP, UNEP, the World Bank. <laughs> We are also conducting uh, investment projects and prototype development for uh, air conditioning products, but basically it is focused on natural refrigerants with the least impact to the environment and climate. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much. I was just about to say the time devil is about to come back on the, the mic, but I'll, I'll hand over to Prasanna and we'll come back to enablers. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Prasanna and I represent uh, an industry, my company ATE in India. Uh, we are an 85 year old small and medium scale enterprise um, with a social uh, uh, aspect to our business, but it's still a business. Since 2005, we've uh, addressed, uh, our management has been interested in the environment and solving problems related to India. So we have a focus in on air, water, and energy. And in this context, uh, on the air, we have uh, developed our own sustainable cooling technology using natural refrigerants, which is called indirect evaporative cooling. Um, in water, we do effluent treatment for heavy polluting industries like textile, pharma, and other industries. And on energy, 
we do solar thermal concentrators, and we also do remote monitoring, which has now evolved into an industrial internet of things. Um, so sustainable cooling is something we've been doing for 15 years. Um, we have about 20 million square feet of installations in India, and uh, we are present in 10 countries. About three years ago, we um, um, got in touch with IFC through the Tech Emerge program, and then in the background, we heard about uh, the UK government and Peter's team funding this, and uh, we participated in um, scaling up and um, introducing sustainable technologies to Latin America. So there we worked in, uh, with a partner in Colombia to introduce this technology. And we are um, uh, participating in the same program, but in uh, India on um, uh, sustainable cooling for district cooling. Okay. So enabling factors for scaling, um, <laughs> coming from the business, I mean, the aim of the business is to make money. And um, we're also talking about innovation. Um, cooling is a 100-year-old technology. So if you're talking innovation, um, it has to be from a little bit left field, as they say in America. And um, but maintaining that constancy of purpose over time, because you are going against the tide, uh, uh, that is very difficult. I mean, and uh, that is what our management has been able to do, um, maintain that constancy of purpose, um, funding it. The other is, when you're doing innovation in this kind of field, um, the entire infrastructure is set up for the conventional technologies. There's no ecosystem um, for the non-conventional technologies. If it is, it is fairly unorganized. Um, so setting up that ecosystem is also part of everything, right from the first sale, which is a concept selling, then making case studies, if there's no laboratory anywhere, then setting up your own laboratory, certification of all the technologies. And you have to do this in the context of the business, and that's what I appreciate uh, what AT has done. So we've been doing that. Um, we've been fortunate, again, I said, with IFC. So we were, everything was a project for us. Uh, convincing a customer used to take a year. Um, but buildings are built in much shorter time scales. So now we are moving over to standard products with our technology. And that was, again, a learning for us um, in a country like India. So having a strong team um, uh, is needed for this um, building the ecosystem. We are there. We are getting there. But it should be beyond the company itself. It should be a community, technical experts, whether they are in the country or outside, um, having infrastructure, laboratories. And when I talk about funding agencies like, um, you know, uh, we, there was a global cooling prize. We were finalists for the same. Again, the UK government funded part of it. It's about keeping that going for four or five years because it takes time to set things up, to develop people, develop everything. So I think that is also very strong. Energy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Diane Maharjan. I am the director of the innovation staff under the National Economic and Development Authority. Our unit is new in NEDA. Uh, we, we were just established last uh, year, uh, pursuant to the Philippine Innovation Act. Uh, we serve as the secretariat to the National Innovation Council. This council is a 25 uh, member, uh, 18 from the government and seven from the private sector. This is being chaired by the President of the Philippines and vice chaired by the Secretary of NEDA. So uh, as a secretariat, we also coordinate the formulation of the National Innovation Agenda and Strategy Document and uh, the promotion of innovation in the country. So as a planning agency, there are two uh, plans that can um, facilitate the enhancement of innovation in the country. Uh, one is the Philippine Development Plan 2023-2028. This is uh, usually crafted at the start of the administration, which uh, spells out the key priorities of the, the administration. So in one of the six cross-cutting strategy in the plan is the establishment of a dynamic innovation ecosystem. I think I'm echoing what uh, <laughs> my colleague here is saying. And uh, we believe that an, an ecosystem needs to be established in order to sustain innovation in the country. 
And um, another document that we are preparing is the one I mentioned, uh, the innovation agenda document. Uh, it will uh, further specify the strategy on how the government can improve the innovation government governance through various uh, levers such as the policies, infrastructure, um, finance, and uh, programs for innovation. Uh, so for the two enabling factors that can uh, affect the scaling of innovation solution, uh, apart from the ecosystem that was already mentioned, another one is to link these innovators to various financial packages and uh, investors. At the government side, an enabling policy, uh, we already have one, uh, the recently enacted Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives uh, Act that mandates our Board of Investment to formulate a strategic investment priority plan that will provide the list of priority projects such uh, that are entitled for incentives. So these incentives can cover in income tax holidays, uh, duty exemptions, and uh, VAT zero rating. Um, so on, under the tier two of this uh, priority plan is actually the sustainable cooling technology. So uh, with this um, enabling policy, it can encourage uh, businesses and enterprises to invest in uh, green cooling. So in addition to this, the role of the government is actually to provide the platforms and avenues where the innovators can actually pitch their uh, technologies or their, their innovation and inform markets about the existing uh, innovative products. The other one is to actually improve the market for these uh, green solutions or this uh, sustainable cooling innovations. Uh, the government can serve actually as one of the primary um, consumers for um, this uh, cooling innovations. Uh, this can be done by institutionalizing the procurement and adoption of energy efficiency and environmentally friendly air conditioning and refrigeration system. Okay, thank you. So I guess UK and Indonesia is not just far from the map, but far from here. Too. Okay, so thank you to have, uh, for having me here. My name is Beta Paramita. So basically, I'm assistant professor in UPI, uh, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. But since I got the grant from the Climate Works uh, in 2019, so uh, we settling the startup. We call it Be Cool Indonesia. That's the product for the cool roof. Uh, that's the partnership. Uh, be from my university, uh, also University of Florida, and also Millennium Solution US. So this product actually uh, adopted the technology from US when they uh, support us the license, and then we locally and uh, find the raw material uh, in the in Indonesia and produce in Indonesia as well. So our product since 2019 until now has already covered around 115,000 square meter roof. And actually it's also can be covered for wall. So uh, basically it is can be reflected the solar radiation and then reduce the heat transfer directly from the surface area comes uh, indoor. So our project, uh, Last time uh, in Jakarta, nearby Jakarta, we can reduce indoor temperature around 11 degrees Celsius. That's very, for me, myself, uh, we are surprised about our uh, yeah, success, this success, because uh, this product is not just like a good innovation for uh, cool, uh, sorry, passive cooling. This is also can be leverage for the low income housing, uh, which is in Indonesia, we have like 17,000, 1,502 uh, islands, which is very a lot of uh, low income housing. And they are surrounding with the, uh, and with the sea level very, very severe for the, for the heat stress also with the, yeah, or also for the another uh, heat uh, club for the global warming. So uh, our product also, we have the opportunity to scale up this innovation, not just uh, in Indonesia. Last time we talked in the Southeast uh, Asia country like Philippines, uh, Singapore, 
Malaysia that we talk each other how if they won't become our uh, partner. So this is also good collaboration between Southeast Asia. We have the same uh, problem. Uh, Big Island also have the same high humidity, high precipitation, also long uh, solar radiation. So I hope uh, our product also can be one of the solution for the passive cooling. Thank you. Great, thanks very much to all of our, our panelists for the opening. Um, I want to, to come back um, to, uh, to, to to Beta and uh, Prasanna actually on um, how do you what do you feel are some of the enablers and barriers to really trying to scale these technologies? And you, you know you've done you've got a, a good portfolio. It's been quite an impressive um, uh, impacts that uh, in both cases have have achieved. But what has been some of the challenges? But also what do you think might be some of the solutions to really take it to the next? The next level. So, are there particular, you know, stakeholders, private financiers, or, or other stakeholders that can really support in that process? Yeah, that's the good question. Uh, for the positive side, uh, because I'm in a university, uh, university actually, uh, I, uh, I, I guess every country have the same uh, perspective of the university. They have the good trust. Uh, and we have like community services program. So the first time when we try to uh, introduce to the community, they still like don't have any idea what is the cool roof itself. So it is very new product in Asia, also Southeast Asia uh, especially. But uh, this is actually not a new product in US or UK, uh, but in our region is still new. And then uh, that's the barrier for the knowledge. But when we try to do like GSR, uh, like the charity, and then we try to make some project pilot, pilot project to several building, like in the uh, like in mosque, also education, and then they see all the all the benefit, so they can uh, yeah, so they can uh, accept all the this this product. So that's only the barrier, only the, this is very new product in Indonesia. Um, from my side, um, like I said, uh, cooling products are, um, I mean, it's a hundred year old, conventional cooling technology is hundred year old. Um, so there's a whole infrastructure around, around that, even at the customer side, all the building uh, inventory and everything. So if you want to go into these buildings, um, what you need to do is first awareness, as uh, Beta just said, everyone has been talking about. Awareness um, is uh, on various levels, but the best is references. And in a country like India, I mean, though data helps, it usually is follow the neighbor, um, you know? And, um, and you can't share the data from one neighbor to another, but you still need data. So having third party validation is important. So with your cooling technology, um, again, this cooling technology is, um, there may be a handful of players around the whole world right now. Um, it's not new, but it has been tried in the past and uh, uh, it has been replaced by conventional air conditioning. So methods have to be developed and um, third party validation sensors. Um, and once that is done, um, it scales up much better. So what we found is going to multinationals in India, because India's economy opened up at the, in the last 20 years, 25 years. Um, multinationals have been good adopters, um, but we still haven't been able to break into tier two, tier three. Um, we are a B2B company only. Um, so we need, um, we had to invest in our own labs. Um, so where, uh, so we had, there's no t standard testing methodology. Um, so we did that and it helped. We also can't be seen as the only person promoting this technology, we can't create the market. Um, so we had to, we also tried to um, say, sell our technology to other OEMs 
and it has been a slow process because they also have people on the ground and they can grow the market. And I'm pleased to say today that there are at, at least a handful of um, suppliers of uh, equipment based on our technology in India. Yeah, so it has helped. But it's also, the market has grown, so we have now competition created by our own self, but that's good. Um, but we need to now uh, productize it. Like I said, coming back to the first point, building inventory is already ready. They have only that much space for um, an air handling unit. You need to bring that product in there. It has to work 24 by seven. It has to work. So we need um, an enabling factor there could be, I mean, the technical rigor for such products, uh, to make such products um, that um, gives confidence to um, those big developers that uh, this is good enough. Otherwise, they'd just go to the top four or five uh, manufacturers in the world, you know. Um, so having that kind of um, support um, also will help uh, take this um, to the next level, making the products. So all this requires time. So I think from a financing point of view, the support um, is money and, um, uh, I mean, money is there. There is uh, no shortage of money around the world or in the country. It's about time. Um, and uh, this particular knowledge, because um, every technology is not uh, a one-to-one -one replacement for anything else. Um, so multiple factors uh, have to be thought out. So learning from others' experience and customizing it into our products for the local market, um, uh, it takes time. So um, I, if, for example, uh, the global t cooling prize uh, was launched in 2018, it was uh, or 19, and um, COVID came, it got delayed by a little bit. There were eight finalists. Uh, there were two finalists from India. Both the technologies were with our technology. And we are still in the beta trial of that product right now. And the aim of the Global Cooling Prize was that within two years you would be at scale or something like that. Um, that doesn't happen on the ground. Uh, so, so it will take time. Uh, but we are working on that. And um, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, case studies, um, some time, validation, you know, around that theme. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And that's a fantastic segue uh, as well to, to my next question. Um, because uh, as you've highlighted, time is, is so crucial. And, and yes, um, sometimes you might hear in other, other forums about finance being a barrier, but um, sometimes it's a, a perception of finance. And as you said, actually, there's quite a lot of finance in the cooling space out there. But actually, time and being able to scale over time is, uh, is, is the challenge. And having that um, persistency uh, with a number of stakeholders, and both you and Beta have highlighted some of the key stakeholders that, that need to be uh, involved in this process. So I wanted to move this question um, to to Diane, if that's okay, about um, you've got lots of really exciting innovation strategies that are being developed, and you mentioned a few types, like the tax incentives, et cetera. Um, how, how have you come up with, the, I guess, the, the decision to, to decide on different types of ways to support innovation? I mean, have, have you sort of tested different models of, of that and, and to come up with the, uh, what you think would help with the scaling and that time question uh, that Prasanna and Bait have mentioned? I think the the growing demand for um, innovative products and uh, during the time of the pandemic, um, innovations has spur because of, uh, well, sometimes when the resources are scarce, you tend to develop more, to become more efficient. So uh, I think the policy environment was there and it was uh, further um, strengthened uh, the the implementation. So, since the enactment of the the law in 2019, then the pandemic uh, also become a learning experience from us that uh, we can innovate and uh, not only to survive but to uh, to still progress, uh, especially the enterprises. Then, uh, with this new administration, innovation becomes a priority to drive our economic. Uh, transformation. Uh, this administration's uh, priority is the social and economic transformation and to create also more jobs and um, more entre um, the tr entrepreneurship become more thriving in the country. So the, 
the plan has set it already and the programs will follow suit based on the to implement those uh, the plan the strategies in the plan so innovation will cut across the sectors but we also prioritized um, research and development technology and innovation continuum so we have uh, specific strategies and priority programs for that as well um, in terms uh, linking it with climate change or sustainable cooling uh, even before the, uh, during the previous years, the government also um, showed their commitment to climate change by submitting a very high um, nationally determined contribution. And uh, climate change is always a, uh, a bedrock strategy in our plans and, and a priority program. And just to share with you, during the last um, National Innovation Council chaired by the president, uh, he actually underscored the importance of climate change and environmental sustainability uh, and ensure and directed us that uh, the innovations should also address our climate vulnerability by developing a more sustainable innovations. And to that, the seventh um, private sector representative will be a climate change expert. So uh, although this is still under the process, the last one, but the others are already appointed. So uh, in the coming um, meetings of the NIC, the climate change expert will be part of the council. Great, and that's, that's fantastic to hear as well. Um, as I th thank you very much, and yeah, re really, really interesting to hear as well about um, how it's, it's very much a priority for for the government as well, and that you've got a climate change expert that's going to join uh, the panel as well. I, I definitely want to pick your brains on that after <laughs> after the uh, after the panel. Um, so I'd like to move to our two uh, donors. I'm going to put you in that category. Um, um, so I think my question is slightly different. Um, so it, it's. It's about, so I'd mentioned about the finance and you know, the, the access to finance, and actually there is finance out there, but sometimes it's not you know, necessarily uh, that you can access it. But do you feel that the climate finance architecture for Kulin as a whole is sufficient? So we know there are existing facilities, but w in your view, from your experiences, do you feel that, um, that it is sufficient? So not necessarily the quantity, but the way that climate finance is delivered for Kulin. I think on behalf of my organization, it's climate finance must be fundamentally rooted in transparency. So uh, I, the Paris Agreement has an enhanced transparency framework in which climate finance must be based on. But I think for countries, the understanding of the concept of transparency is still not yet very clear, or there is still a, a common understanding is still not yet fully um, implemented. But as... Um, Prasanna mentioned, in countries like the, uh, in developing countries or Article 5 countries of the Montreal Protocol, um, it is very difficult to innovate because uh, the specific uh, technology has no standards. As you know, standards uh, for the product, the process, and the people are, there are standards set by the international standards organizations and promoted by the Montreal Protocol. But the problem is the conformity to the standard itself. So he mentioned the lack of testing facilities, the lack of qualified auditors for energy audits, technology audits, and also the training necessary in order to ensure that the technology implemented is sustained. Um, it's not only sustainable cooling, but uh, sustainable transition, which is just. so. I mean, the, the workers do know, because on the side of GIZ, we have a strong component on training uh, technicians working on cooling technologies. And I think for it is not just a simple air conditioner that you have to be trained on, but the scale and the magnitude of the cooling requirements must also be equivalent to the competency of the person working on the cooling system. So. I think one, one of the support areas we have is conformity to the standards, not only of the equipment or the technology, but of the people working on the, um, the technology itself. Great, no, thanks very much. And, and that, that sounds like a, a suggestion for more technical assistance types of uh, climate finance approach. And we know that ESMAP is a leader in technical assistance looking at standards. 
Yeah, I, I think if, if I may take a step back and respond to your question about the finance uh, infra, uh, structure for reaching access to cooling and transition to sustainable cooling. I, I would like to uh, answer that question by saying that first of all, I agree with everything that has been said here uh, about uh, the, 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 the challenges at the level of specific uh, enterprises like uh, you explained, at the level of the need for transparency, for standards, and all that. But I want to take a step back and be broader. Uh, I think the main challenge in terms of the finance ar uh, architecture is not the resources. Um, I, ex I, I took a long time to explain all the different resources that uh, the World Bank and ISMAP can put at the disposal of actors that want to do cooling. The real challenge from the perspective of the donors that look at this as a contribution to sustainable economic and social development and clean energy is more the fact that cooling is always a part of something. I mean, it, we, we focus on the discussion on cooling, but if you think two step back, cooling is always part of something. For example, uh, agriculture cold chain in agriculture, cold chain in health, vaccines, but not only vaccines, uh, passive cooling in urban areas, and I could continue. When you think about that, cooling is important, but cooling will not do it alone. Uh, if I go back to the cold chain, the cold chain in agriculture requires transportation. Uh, uh, you, uh, because cold chain using cooling will be a success at the scaling level only if it reaches aggregation. You don't put cool, cooling artifacts in every former house. That, that's not you, how you do it. You do it at a massive level and then you have transportation to the individual farmers. So the, big, the same, I would say, when you look at urban, air conditions that we have discussed this at length is very important, but it's only one item that will achieve a urban area where you have really clean energy. And so the main challenge that we face uh, is not so much the existence of resources, but the challenge of scaling up and integrating any activity that you do in cooling in the real chain of activities, be health, agriculture, urban, or others. Only there you can achieve from a development and clean transition a real uh, impact. Because, of course, is a beauty, is in is a great success doing it at the pilot level. But as you have explained it very much in detail, the, the proof of the pudding is be sustainable and be upscale. So I, I, I think that this is what I would like to add. Uh, I hope I am addressing your question. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. No, thank, thanks very much. And now we've got an opportunity as well to uh, get questions from, from the floor as well. So we have a break at 3.30. So I think we've got about 15 minutes, I would say, for questions. Um, so there's a Roman mic that hopefully can come around because uh, I know that you mentioned the app is uh, and not working. <laughs> so, yeah, question there. My, good afternoon, uh, Gloria Tirado, a lawyer, student from the Pamantasan of Lungsod, Bang Maynila. I'm here to write a thesis, but my question goes, first question goes to uh, the uh, Neda <laughs> lady. Mom, I would like to ask, I used to be a head of a human resource in one of our government uh, agencies. We do have an employee Actually, it's not, he's not an employee, he's an SB personnel who got an invitation from the uh, Australian government to present his paper about this uh, sizing of battery energy storage system in a photovoltaic off-grid. Uh, I, I wanted to help him, so what I did is I wrote a letter to DOE, I wrote a letter to DOST because this, 
the, the, actually, he's not alone. Uh, uh, together with other classmates of him from a, a state university. So uh, uh, my question to you is that uh, how, how do you help students like this with innovative ideas? And uh, uh, they don't get any funding from the institution. Uh, they have a very brilliant ideas. So uh, how can you help these students? I am also a uh, professor. That's why uh, I, I want to uh, be, you know, <laughs> uh, be knowledgeable on this so that once I already uh, or again have uh, a, a situation like this, I know what to do now. Actually, there are different ways, ma'am, for that uh, student or group of students. Uh, it's correct. Uh, you can go to the DOSD through the Philippine uh, Innovative Startup Act. We have a startup program, which is being managed by DOSD, DTI, and the ICT. So in, in specific, the one managing the startup that can uh, further help the student um, develop their product into uh, until a commercialization is the uh, DOSD PISERD uh, through Dr. Pari Eric Paringit. So maybe later I can... I think I wrote a letter yeah. to him. So, so they will help him? Uh, that's one, ma'am. Maybe they have to discuss first the, the concept and uh, the way they can uh, help the student. Uh, another one, ma'am, is that uh, because of the Innovation Act, there is actually a provision on the establishment of a revolving fund. But this one will fund um, enterprises who needs um, initial capital for uh, developing their product. So I, I, I think it depends on where the stage of your student is. So I, maybe I need to know more about the details later. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can, can follow up after if that's OK, just to give other people the, the floor. But uh, I know a number of the MDVs do have young entrepreneurs' uh, funds uh, as well. I know ADB definitely had one because uh, previous ASEFs before COVID, um, they'd always showcase student uh, innovations on, in the opening plenaries, which were always really fascinating to I look, have one look more forward to. Can question? Is it OK? Can we? Can you hold it? And then oh, I'll okay. give others the opportunity, sure. and then I'll come back to you. But thank you for your question. I think the lady at the back uh, had her hand up. Hi, uh, this is Usha from Nepal. Um, I am working in one of the projects uh, called Building Energy Efficiency in Nepal. And uh, as you all know, space conditioning is taking up a lot of energy right now. And in Nepal, it's a fast one of the fastest growing urbanizing uh, country. It's a small country, but it's fastest growing in terms of urbanization. And the space cooling is taking up a lot of energy. Uh, while I was listening to you, uh, there are few innovations done. My question to uh, like anyone can like help me out with that question. What is the technology transfer to smaller countries or what, what it takes to do that and how it's going to be tackled, uh, I want you to know that. Because there are problems and uh, there, there are people who would like to take it up as a business, as a project, and also uh, the technology transfer could be um, one of the thank, issues. Thank you for the question. I'll pass it to Marida. Yeah. Um, I think for technology transfer to smaller countries, it's also essential that there is a standards conformity component. Like for buildings, in the Philippines, we are starting with a building energy efficiency index. So there is a, a measure for buildings to um, determine its level of energy performance. However, you have to first set a standard for your buildings in the first place. So. Um, actually, GI set does support um, adoption or uh, creation of local standards. So we can do it through a, a technical assistance or a technical cooperation project on behalf of the German government. Uh, just to elaborate further, um, in terms of its map and of the World Bank, and I would say in general, uh, I would say the, the multinationals and the multi development agencies and perhaps also bilateral is that usually 
you can have a transfer of knowledge because there are many activities that foster that exchange of uh, knowledge between countries or dissemination. But usually the way it happens is that the government will have a program or will have some activities and discuss that with the development agencies. So it will not happen so much on a case-by-case -case firm, but rather a program that can help either a sector or a certain group of activities, like the, the incubators, the things. So the, the best way to do that is to be aware of the kind of priorities at the level of the government where your needs can be addressed, and also be aware that there are standalone exchange activities of knowledge, like, like where we are today as SEF, but there are many others organized exactly for that purpose of exchanging knowledge, and that is the beginning for after that knowing what exact program you could then tap on and go further in terms of technical assistance. So it's a matter of, of really investing time in understanding what kind of programs uh, the development agencies that work in your countries and in your sector can have. And the first thing is easy is internet. That, that gives you a sense of your, where you can get the help. Thank you. Um, if I may ask uh, a clarification, is this a one-off case? Are you working and are you looking at this from a context of the government or, or a uh, private enterprise? Uh, no, I'm uh, working for a project funded by European Union under the Switch Asia Grant Program. Mm. And we are working with 60 uh, local governments to put up a bylaws uh, that are um, supporting the sustainable housing or, let's say, energy efficient housing. And one of the needs for um, housing is the space conditioning. And we are looking into the aspect of uh, looking in the, into the possibility of RE-based technologies or energy efficient space conditioning systems and cooling is one of the major need uh, in these projects. So we are supporting the government also, government, the, in local government I would say, to develop the bylaws uh, towards that one. Standard I do understand like, but how to help the I mean, uh, private sector, the, uh, the small yeah. enterprises, or uh, medium and large scale enterprises who could transfer these uh, innovations to Nepal and have the sustainable supply of See, those materials, uh, yes. I mean, coming purely from the other side, the business side, yeah. you directly approach them. The, um, you know, Nepal has its own microclimate, you know, though it may be different. Um, depending on the situation there on the ground, what is the space required, how much is the cooling required, is it heating or cooling mixed and other things, you can directly approach us or any other um, technologies if you have shortlisted them. Yeah. It could be a, a case study you could just do on a private basis first before approaching and uh, you know other organizations and then doing a comparison and other things. We can talk after the... Yeah, thank uh, you. And not only our company, but other I could introduce you to yeah, others I think uh, as far as... Uh, I have the uh, knowledge and uh, technology transfer is not straightforward. Um, yes, we work um, with there, is a, there is an investment required for technology adap adaptation, like there is a lot of work to be done when the technology is being transferred from one country to another. It so depends on the model I, applied. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would add two different things to the, co to the conversation. I think you are talking perhaps about two kinds of needs. One is the one of, of transfer at the level of the sector or a program. This you can do by technical assistance with the multi-development the multi agencies. And also, for instance, in SMAP, one of our core mandate is to have uh, knowledge. So 
to, to disseminate knowledge. And so part of the questions that you are asking, you may find them already in analytical pieces or in best practice, good practices that, you will that we have developed precisely to help with this transfer, not by copying and pasting, but by looking at the exact program and extracting uh, good practices and recommendations. So I think that that is at the level of transfer in a systemic way. The second one, if it is at the level of the firms where you are having a problem and you are asking for who could answer that is the kind of prog program that, we, uh, that in IFC and you are one of the participants in the tech emerge where you have both you identify the innovator after having understood what is the user need. So there is a matching made that basically will understand the problem that you're trying to face and will try to match you with somebody in private sector who could answer that kind of problem. So is a, is a two level of solutions, one at the level of the enterprises and another at the level of the sector. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I think definitely following up on that um, that, that Turk Emerge model is an interesting one as well. Um, I think there's obviously a lot of different ways to facilitate and support innovation. The Tech Emerge model is just one, and it's a matchmaking approach. Um, there's obviously incubators, accelerators. Um, ADB has ADB Ventures that looks at venture vest in that slightly later stage, and that's more about the business model. Um, so there's lots of different ways to facilitate it. Um, I think the sorts of examples given here um, are, are very good for that sort of tech transfer, knowledge transfer piece that, that you mentioned. Um, we have a time for a couple more questions. Um, so if, if no one's got their hand up, I'll, I'll go back to um, our la uh, the lady who is a former HR uh, head in the, in the Philippines. Uh, my next question goes to the World Bank personal mom, uh, uh, Clemencia Masley. Uh, concerning the uh, sustainable cooling, uh, that technology, how far is World Bank uh, in terms of... Uh, 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 in terms of social security for the uh, people, working, working force, uh, I mean, uh, do you have a particular project wherein you are looking at the uh, workforce uh, in terms of this uh, technology on sustainable cooling uh, in correlation with social security, meaning uh, their welfare, uh, uh, are uh, those uh, uh, partners of yours? Let me try to address your question if I under understand it correctly. Uh, I would say that when you, if your question is okay, you are doing some sustainable cooling and then that will imply activities by workers, obviously. Uh, do you look into the welfare of those workers? And I would say that the answer is yes, because that is a standard obligation. I mean, any projects that the World Bank does, ESMAP doesn't do project, okay? So the answer here is at the level of the World Bank, because ESMAP provides resources to the World Bank that will do projects. So when the World Bank does project, it looks at the workers by definition, there is a, any project that takes place has to respect, uh, 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 has a program where you have many aspects, and I'm not going to name all of them, but some of them include health and security system. So at the level of the client, which is the government, the utility, and then at the level of every contractor, they have to develop and adapt and use uh, implement uh, uh, protocols to ensure the health and security of their workers. That is one aspect of it. So the answer simply is yes, because it's mandatory. The second way in which that is also taken care of is about the gender part. And that is a part of the programs that more and more, uh, some as we talk cooling, we talk gender. There is a whole uh, activity and ESMAP is part of that, where we foster the participation of women 
as part of the workforce in whatever project we do, for instance, in energy. And that goes from activities as simple as developing network of women, but also supporting, for instance, internship of, of young uh, ladies, or I don't know exactly what is the word in English, uh, girls that will be either in high school or in university. So there is a systemic uh, way of trying to support the women as part of the workforce, but also more generally, women and men by training, by capacity, and the other aspect that I just mentioned. So I hope I address uh, your, your question. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question before the break. And then they've put their hand down, or? <laughs> the answer was provided. Alex. I try to um, grow the ESCO market across 10 Asian countries. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I formed the Asia Pacific ESCO Industry Alliance. And we try to embrace uh, cooling technologies, but much of the ESCO ESCOable, ESCO investable cooling technologies are often the larger central district cooling. And it's still, it's still early days as far as, um, number one, the smaller cooling technologies uh, are not yet uh, generally, uh, there's reluctance to cover smaller package split type VRFs. Um, in number two, there's even more reluctance and there's lacking in methodology to consider building envelope solutions such as cool roofs, right? Because there's, there's no entity or no ESCO-like entity that could correlate your 11 degree drop in temperature with um, energy consumption. So one question, I'd just like to get comments from the panel, maybe one from uh, Cool Roofs Indonesia. Has there been any attempt to correlate it with ESCO, uh, ESCOs in Indonesia so that energy performance contracting can use cool roof solutions? In, and maybe from the GIZ standpoint, have, es have ESCOs tried to embrace, let's say, bulk phase out of fixed speed air conditioning and put all either solar assisted and in, in the inverter type air conditioning as the Philippine government is trying to do, right? Uh, it has set mother policies. Maybe the innovation council will play a role in that and then flow it down to all uh, public buildings. Uh, so uh, the, the connection of ESCO performance contracts with building envelopes such as school roofs and smaller uh, air conditioning systems. It's a very small question to finish off uh, the panel. Um, so, uh, so I'll oh. ask Beta just if you can do it in, yeah. in sort of 45 seconds and then uh, Mariah, 45 seconds and then we'll wrap up and close. So it's a very, very interesting question. Also, uh, that's a big challenge in Indonesia as itself. So when we try to introduce to community first, uh, our barrier just like the knowledge as itself. But then uh, when we try to develop another party like uh, industrial and then another commercial, the hesitance to use this product is much more bigger actually. Yeah, because this is new and then who am I and something like that. So, and then the most important thing that uh, this is not an obligatory, not mandatory in Indonesia. We don't have any building code for SRI. What I have to do this like now, uh, right now is we going to uh, make the manuscript as the as national standard. So another thing that uh, in Indonesia, our electricity bill somehow is very affordable uh, when the energy price is not that high. And they say like, if uh, the cool roof can be reduced like six until 10% until of the electricity bill, this is not really uh, significant for the, the whole cost. Uh, so that's why we are parallel uh, between the government, uh, I'm in the academic center, and then also my another like uh, another foot in the private sector. So we are parallel to do all the things. Uh, how this passive cooling can be together uh, with the 
government, uh, academic, also the community. Yes, actually it brings back the memory when we had the challenge of doing the air conditioning transition NAMA, which is the mitigation action facility of the German government. I think for the Philippines, or let's say for ESCOs, um, you must have at least a performance requirement for ESCOs, regardless of the technology they use. But the unit of measure we have for ESCOs is usually money, monetary, rather than technology. I think it's also essential that when, since we're doing uh, performance standards for appliances, performance standards for buildings, um, the ESCO itself must have at least a, a commitment within the, itself that it's going for the truly green cooling technology or the truly climate friendly uh, option. So basically you can only have this by really measuring uh, the impacts of the ESCO's choices of technology in providing the product or the service to their customers. So I think that's uh, a responsibility of the ESCOs themselves to, so, but the problem with the smaller appliances is the return on investment. Maybe we should also monetize um, its emission reduction potential or carbon, the, the potential for, you know, uh, having carbon markets or a, a carbon credit for what they are doing as ESCOs. If I may add a little bit um, from our experience. If, you, if you're like 20 seconds, yes, Max. Certainly. Our impression, the consumers buy when there's a value story. And as um, Clemence mentioned, if you're just talking cooling, cooling relates to productivity improvement or a health improvement. And in most cases, we have actually um, worked with our customers in helping them demonstrate their productivity improvements. But that is something they do internally. You know, they don't share it with us because then we go and tell somebody else, and then that's the competition. So if there are independent studies you do on productivity improvements, for example, it has been done in call centers, health improvements, infection, reduced infection transmission, all this has been done in the Western world, I mean, developed world I'm talking about. Call centers has been done studies in Thailand, studies in India and other things. But in industry, productivity improvements has not been done and in the our market. If certain case studies are published, they become the things. The money is not in the saving, it is in the productivity, in what we, our example is in the, product, is in the production improvement, which is not captured. Um, I, we're going to have to we're going to have to wrap up there because the people want their uh, the coffee, of course, including me. Um, but this has obviously been a fantastic discussion, um, and I think you know you've seen this. There's, there's lots of both support from from governments and donors, and lots of experience from innovators that are doing this right now on the ground, and how they've tried to scale and also even start to test in different countries as well, um, which is fantastic. Um, do stick around after the break. We're going to go more into the policy dimension, but we're also going to do a consultation on something called the Global Cooling Pledge as well. So we're going to hear from a number of, of governments and other stakeholders uh, about what we're going to do ahead of, of COP28 on that. Uh, so thanks very much, and join me in uh, thanking the panel. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and to those of you who are uh, continuing to join us here at uh, this deep dive workshop on sustainable cooling. We appreciate uh, your being here. We are now entering the second half of the workshop. The second half is going to be more focused on country leadership, so examples of policy progress um, and innovative finance as well um, that have supported leadership on sustainable cooling in the region. We're going to hear from a number of, uh, of country experts and officials from uh, countries in the region, um, but before that, we're going to have uh, introductory remarks um, from uh, Mr. Mr. Liu from UNESCAP, followed by a presentation by Anna, Anna, um, uh, excuse me, Anna uh, Lobanova of UNESCAP, and then I will give a short presentation on the Global Cooling Pledge, and following that we'll have a we'll have a panel discussion. So um, hopefully this will be an interesting session. I'm personally I'm really looking forward to it. I think we want to get some insight into how we can leverage the Global Cooling Pledge for policy progress in the region based on what's, what's sort of 
happened here already and the leadership that's been demonstrated in the region already. So, uh, but I won't go on. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Hong Peng Lu, who's the director of the Energy Division at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to give welcome remarks, Mr. Lu. Thank you, Ben. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to uh, open this session, uh, the discussion on policy, uh, stock take, and regional leadership and the global cooling pledge to discuss uh, uh, pressing issues in our warming world, sustainable cooling. Access to sustainable cooling is not just a luxury, but a comfort living requirement and also vital climate mitigation actions and adaptation strategies. You know, uh, I just recall once you know, there was uh, uh, the story about uh, the Singapore's founding father. I, I, I don't know whether you already heard about this. Lee Kong Yeo once in the interview in 2010 about uh, Singapore's success. You know, uh, the question was, uh, Anything else besides uh, uh, multicultural tolerance that uh, enabled Singapore's success? No, his answer was uh, conditioning. You know, he mentioned about uh, air conditioning. Air conditioning was the most important invention for us. Perhaps one of the signal inventions of history. It changed the, the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. So if you imagine, like we have the, the forums here, you know, over a thousand or a few hundred people in one building and without uh, air conditioning. So what will happen? It's very difficult. Like what uh, he said when he be became the prime minister, he was install air conditioners in buildings where the civil services uh, efficiency actually improved. So that's really a, a good example you know, how this kind of cooling you know, improves the civilization of the human beings. So we are talking about sustainable cooling now, and that goes beyond the provide the comfort. It holds the potential to improve energy efficiency, reduce emissions, protect against the heat stress, enable productivity, and support well-being, reduce food losses, and enhance access to health care and Medicare uh, and medicines. So the growth of cooling demand leads to a significant increase in electricity consumption. So that's where you know, we see there's a positive side, but we also see the positive side for electricity demand. But at the same time, it also brings the, the increase of the uh, greenhouse gas emission. Because uh, uh, it's estimated that cooling accounts for about 50% of total electricity consumed in some cities, some countries in Asia Pacific region, especially in those, uh, okay, especially in those uh, countries in the tropical uh, uh, climate. Despite the importance of the uh, issue, cooling has been often overlooked, overlooked in policies, planning, and the regulations at a different level. It's crucial for policymakers to, prior, to prioritize and integrate the cooling strategies into sustainable development agenda to reduce the environmental impact. So to help address this issue, a national cooling action plan methodology was developed to support the assessment of national cooling sectors and also to help establish a comprehensive forward for meeting cooling needs in an energy efficient and climate friendly manner. So to this end, ESCAP together with the UNEP and the Alliance of an Energy Efficient Economy in collaboration with the members of a Cool Coalition and was potentially, and was also piloted in Cambodia and about this National Cooling Action Plan. I think my colleague Anna will share with you more details about the methodology and also how we do to work together with the other partners and also the country to develop national cooling action plans. So we have done this work together with the government and also the development partners in Cambodia 
and uh, Vietnam. I think uh, Indonesia is also ongoing. Uh, my colleague Anna definitely will share with you all the details uh, what we are doing. Considering the sig significant and increasing demand for cooling, particularly in the region with a hot climate, regional leadership becomes crucial. And uh, those countries, we really expect that they will demonstrate how this national cooling action plan will support the, the, the development of high efficient cooling and the sustainable cooling. We also see India, probably it's the first country to develop their national cooling action plan with the energy efficiency as a part of this national plan. So I really think that's uh, all set up good examples and also with this kind of uh, innovative ideas and also to support the financing, uh, with the financing support and also leverage technology to tackle these challenges heads on. It also uh, contribute to achieving SDGs we, we talk a lot about uh, SDGs and in particular SDG 7 and focus on affordable and clean energy. So today we will learn from those success stories, best practices and experiences. So before I conclude, I want to emphasize that significance of the global cooling pledge. I think uh, Ben will also share about this. Uh, this is an initiative which will be, I think, officially launched at uh, COP28 by uh, UAE uh, COP20 presidency in collaboration with the uh, uh, cool coalitions, SE4 and the IRENA. So it's uh, vital for countries in the Asia Pacific region to take active leadership in meeting this challenge. Being part of a core coalition, ASCAP will support member states in their commitment to sustainable cooling and also to join this uh, kind of uh, uh, pledge for cooling. This session will give us a good opportunity to discuss it. I really think the country good practices and the actions will be promoted through this kind of discussion. So I encourage all of the participants to actively engage in the discussion and provide a share about your knowledge and the views. So together we can accelerate, I think, sustainable cooling in this region through regional cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Liu, and I think it's an especially important point on, I think, the opportunities that are there when we integrate cooling into the sustainable development and the climate agenda together. Um, and we'll hear a little bit more about that coming up. But for now, uh, we have a scene setting presentation coming up from Ms. Anna uh, Lobanova on regional policy progress and national cooling action plans. So I'd like to invite you to the stage, please. Hello and welcome everyone. It's uh, definitely my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ben, for an introduction. And uh, my colleague, uh, Hongfeng, already provided a very detailed description why we need to talk about cooling. But uh, I think it's great that we have this conversation here in Manila because we just need to step out outside from the building and we immediately realize why we need to talk about cooling. Because it's not uh, only about numbers. Uh, like this year, there was announced that Southeast Asia experienced new all-time record for the temperature in May, in April. It was more like 40 plus degrees in Bangkok. Uh, where we are based, but it's never about numbers. It's about how it affects people and uh, it affects productivity. It affects all the sectors across economy, uh, from agriculture to um, medicine, how it was uh, well described uh, during the previous session. So let's deep dive a little bit more what we can do uh, to make sure that uh, we take comprehensive action to uh, deal with cooling. And uh, here is just the diagram showing what we have, what's um, affecting cooling demand and uh, its urbanization, climate change, and it's growing, 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 but what we can do to bend this curve. And uh, in ASCAP, uh, how my colleague uh, already mentioned, we are working uh, together with uh, other organizations under the 
cool uh, coalition. We're working together with uh, UNAP and uh, some other organizations on developing national cooling action plan. What's the specifics about this document? Because we all always hear about different targets, about uh, different um, commitments countries make. So with this uh, document, with methodology um, developed, the document tries to provide a comprehensive response to the targets, to how uh, the targets which governments make under the, um, their NDCs. Uh, also, it includes sustainable development goals and it includes uh, targets under uh, Kigali Amendment. And the key idea is to reduce um, cooling pressure on energy system to lower energy demand and to uh, unlock economic savings through the energy efficiency measures. Uh, the methodology of national cooling action plans available on ASCAP website. Here is just a brief overview how it's been done and the key idea that it's been done with the cooperation uh, through uh, national governments and uh, methodology can be adjusted and tailored to the specific country needs. So the idea is that the, uh, the, it includes seven steps, starting with mapping the existing effort and the existing policies, what are in country, and then through um, modeling, um, identifying uh, the demand, the growing demand, and with the last step providing uh, detailed recommendation to the country through the, uh, all the sectors, because it was mentioned before uh, that cooling involves various sectors in the economy. So, um, with this methodolog methodology, ASCAP, together with our partners, developed uh, and piloted National Cooling Action Plan in Cambodia. Uh, it was announced during the last COP, and uh, currently we are working uh, their first steps on implementation of that. And uh, um, I'm not the one who is going to tell you how important it is for Cambodia, because Cambodia, as many other Southeast Asia countries, share same challenges, what we just talked about. So it is vital for the country economy to work on um, cooling there is a brief overview of measures and policy recommendations what were provided for uh, Cambodia, how to move forward. And uh, the key idea is to provide a, um, comprehensive and detailed recommendations for various sectors of economy. And uh, here is just an overview and uh, uh, the full document is available on ASCAP and uh, Cambodia government webpage, uh, so that uh, you may have a look uh, if you're interested in uh, more details. And uh, with remaining time, I would like um, to uh, provide the target, like where we go with this. So the key idea is that with the implementation of recommendation, uh, Cambodia will be able to reduce uh, their, um, to increase the electricity saving by 14% uh, by 2030 and 23% by uh, 2040. And uh, as I mentioned, ASCAP uh, is not only uh, working with the country to uh, provide recommendations, but also how to make these uh, recommendations into life. And uh, here we move from like the top level to the specific sector, and uh, we work with building sector in Cambodia, and currently the project is under implementation, how to use passive cooling solutions to inform building codes and building standards uh, in a country. Um, and uh, there are a couple of uh, directions how we work on that. First is uh, uh, working on uh, um, me measuring the effect of implementation of uh, uh, passive cooling solutions and then informing 
um, building sector and building standards with that. And also the second important part is implementation of traditional um, passive cooling solutions through the modern uh, architecture. Because obviously somehow Cambodia lived with this, um, in this climate before. So mm, the importance of traditional architecture um, is also bringing into life with the current and modern solutions. So um, this is uh, just brief overview of what we do uh, in ASCAP. And uh, if you have uh, some questions, please reach out. All the documents are available on our website. And uh, um, I wish all the productive discussion today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I just I, I want to. Uh, just to emphasize, I think, how, um, how important the development of this model uh, NCAP methodology was and recognize the work of UNSCAP um, as well as AEEE and UNEP in developing it. Um, initially, I think these types of plans had sort of been about uh, implementing the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Um, and then it was another step to ensure that energy efficiency for cooling was recognized within these types of plans. It's yet another step to go uh, to have them be so comprehensive that they address this topic of access to cooling um, and to address topics like passive cooling, agricultural cold chains, medical cold chains, um, and the role of, of cooling in supporting equity. And the model National Cooling Action Plan methodology that was developed by UNSCAP and, and partners really does that, and the fact that they're you know, working actively in the region to promote it and implement and use it is, I think, a real important testament to how far we've come. So thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to skip over to my presentation now, which is on the Global Cooling Pledge. Um, I'm not sure if there's a roaming mic, but that might be good if I could grab one in a, in a moment. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, for, those if, for those of you who, who don't know, my name is Ben Hartley. I work for Sustainable Energy for All. Um, to give you a bit of context, the United Arab Emirates, as uh, COP28 president, has asked the Cool Coalition to help support the development of a, of a global cooling pledge. The idea is that this pledge is, is developed over sort of the first course, uh, first, ha first half of the year, launched in the summer, and campaigned on towards COP28 to showcase all the commitments that are given towards it at COP. Thank you very much. I think this might be a little bit easier, so I'm going to do it this way. Upside down. <laughs> okay, so some context. In a warming world, cooling is not a luxury. It's an issue of equity. I think we've been trying to reinforce this message over the last few years, and I think it's starting to land. You know, when we think about um, the role of cooling in society and how it supported development in the tropics, in a warming world, we have to we have to we have to sort of solidify this. So, you know, there's some interesting stats here about. Uh, job losses um, associated with heat, job losses and economic losses associated with heat stress. There's an ILO study that I would recommend everybody have a look at. Um, heat, extreme heat impacts health. Almost one third of the world's population faces dangerous temperatures for more than 20 days a year. I said this as well at the beginning of the opening session, uh, the first session, but in case you, you weren't here to hear that part, uh, we had a study from The Lancet recently that estimated that in 2019, just over 350,000 died, people died uh, due to extreme heat. Uh, about five years before, the sort of known, or the accepted statistic on that from the WHO was 12,000 a year. So this problem is increasing. We're beginning to understand what the impacts of extreme heat are, and we know that the, that the mortality impact is growing. Of course, there's also uh, uh, an impact on food supply. Lack of effective refrigeration results in losses to approximately 13% of total food production. Um, so there's issues there and, uh, and similar issues on the vaccine cold chain. But the more we cool, the more we heat the planet. Um, and demand for space cooling is already straining grids, and we know it will, we know it will increase. It's also increasingly a service that people need in off-grid areas, um, in agricultural production in particular, and in the home. Uh, in hot climates where uh, a fan may be the difference between suffering from heat stress in a rural area and not. Um, 
So in addition to being a top driver of electricity and peak demand, it's also one of the biggest contributors to global warming. It estimates vary between about 7 and 10% of global GHG emissions, which is expected to double by 2030 and triple by 2050 without w at business as usual. So all this being said, there's a sort of substantial cooling opportunity. Um, the Kigali Amendment, um, it's been estimated that if fully implemented, um, could avoid up to 0 0.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by the year 2100. Higher efficiency standards can also more than double the efficiency of AC units on the market and reduce energy demand for cooling by just shy of 50%, about 45%. Um, coordinated international action is also very important, particularly on energy efficiency, as we've heard in a couple sessions this week here at, uh, at ASEF, and could avoid as much as 460 billion tons of GHG emissions. Um, and efficient cooling can generate savings, as we know, in the estimates about um, of nearly three trillion between now and 2050. So, cool cop. Um, I think, to give you a very sort of quick story, this, this has evolved through a prioritization that the COP presidency um, in the UAE has put on cooling. There are um, three sort of um, important focuses um, that, the, that the COP presidency has, has uh, indicated to us. The first is cooling input in the global climate stock take, and UNEP is working with the partners of the Cool Coalition currently to prepare a spotlight report that's led by the Cool Coalition. Second is commitments to, to concrete measurable actions at COP28, which is sort of the global cooling pledge and support announcements. And then finally is a uh, high-level moment at COP28 that's being planned, a cooling leadership segment, uh, which would include ministerial and non-state leaders, as well as technology demonstrations. I've lost it again. What's that? <laughs> Are you able to flip through that? Yeah. Yep. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about the Cool Coalition. Um, there are a, a wide variety of, of members of the Cool Coalition. It includes, uh, you know, as of last count, it was about 130 partners. Um, it includes governments, finance, uh, finance business development organizations, civil society, and part of the point of it is to just generate the collaboration that's necessary to sort of catalyze action on sustainable cooling. It has a number of working groups, uh, it covers a number of topics, and for those who, who may not know, it was born out of the 2019 Climate Action Summit led by the UN Secretary General, where it was chosen as a transformational initiative out of the energy transition track. Oh, we're back. <laughs> Perfect. Um, global collaboration. So in January at Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, uh, the UAE presidency announced the development of this global cooling pledge. Um, and I guess what we're describing is the cool COP menu of actions. The pledge has been drafted, drawing on the technical uh, capabilities of the members of the Cool Coalition, and is now a document that's sort of being consulted on to understand what works for governments and what doesn't, and how do we need to incorporate um, um, different types of entities into it. And you can see here a few sort of uh, testimonials from Cool Champions that we hope to uh, uh, get more of in the coming months to help us uh, galvanize um, efforts towards this pledge. So recently, um, cooling has been included in the COP28 official program as part of the Just Energy Transition slash Industry slash Trade Day on December 6th, with the specifier that the day will additionally have a specific focus on cooling as a critical mitigation and adaptation issue. Um, so yeah, I sort of gave you the um, gave you the the intro here, but I think. The other bit to sort of fill in is that the way that the pledge is sort of set up now is that it's a series of, of over our, it's a preamble, a series of overarching commitments, and then it's asking committers to commit to two sort of implementation actions. And this is very important, I think, to the, the UAE as, as COP presidency to show that there are actionable things, quantifiable things, measurable things that are going to come out of this. Um, the idea at present is that this is launched at SEM, the SEM and G20 Energy Ministerial in Goa in July and will be followed by a campaign to secure commitments up to COP28 like I mentioned. 
Here's a little bit of the schedule of events. There have been several events so far. Um, it started in uh, Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. There was one in March uh, at the G20 SEM prep meeting. Um, again, it's been, we've been active in the G20 sort of energy ministerial process in, uh, in India. Um, there was a session um, at the 79th session of, of, as, of the Commission of ESCAP. And of course, we're here now at uh, the Asia Clean Energy Forum. So to give you a sense of the timeline, again, the idea is that, that this is launched in July um, with the high-level political forum being an important next moment. So I want to sort of take a few minutes here to talk about the pledge itself um, and give you sort of a sense of what is in it before we move to our panel discussion. So I'll, I think there's maybe five or six slides, but I'll try and go through them relatively efficiently. Um, the what the pledge is asking specifically, I guess, is that participants commit to a series of overarching things. So commit to work together to collectively increase access to sustainable cooling. Commit to work together to collectively increase the average efficiency rating of new air conditioner equipment. Uh, com commit to support ambitious measures and financial resources under the Montreal Protocol. Um, to raise ambition on MEPS and to establish building codes that, that are both energy efficient and use passive technology measures. Additionally, uh, there are clauses in here on committing to support the reduction of food loss and waste through sustainable cold chains, um, the development of a national cooling action plan, which is viewed as, as you've heard, as a very key sort of enabling policy piece that helps guide investment and further progress on sustainable cooling. Um, Nature-based solutions for uh, urban environments also very important. Um, the benefits of, of a tree uh, 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 and nature in cities can ha really help reduce temperatures, and we've seen uh, evidence of this in, in Medellin, Colombia, in particular. Um, some, you know, I've, I've heard the phrase, you know, "tree is nature's air conditioner," and we hope to promote that a little bit through the pledge as well. Um, public reporting and to and to support international action. Um, I think this is sort of um, relatively straightforward as well. And if, if you're interested in a copy of uh, in getting a copy of this, please just let me know after the session. The next component is the request to sort of uh, for the participants of the, of the pledge to agree to additionally implement two of the two or more of the following commitments. Uh, one is to complete uh, the ratification of the Kigali Amendment. Uh, another is. Uh, provision of financial resources under the Montreal Protocol uh, multilateral fund, the MLF, um, to integrate cooling into energy access planning. Um, this is something that, for, from se for all side, we see as a very sort of important, timely, and necessary intervention because uh, we see wide gaps on SDG 7 and electrification. And we know that those gaps could grow, at least in terms of household energy services, given the cooling needs, if cooling needs are not met sustainably within that. So, that's another element, as well as the sort of productive potential of, of transitioning the agricultural sector uh, towards um, sustainable agricultural cold chains. Um, to invest in innovation and deployment of renewable, renewable energy-based cooling technologies and applications. Um, the establishment of national resources to aid states and cities in their evaluation and support for a transition to sustainable cooling. And so the list sort of goes on. Um, there are a number of these different types of initiatives. And the idea is that there is enough sort of breadth here to allow for countries to easily make commitments to these types of things. It's also been sort of noted that one element that the, the pledge itself is very much targeted to national governments. The idea is that national governments make commitments. But as many of you will probably appreciate, um, cities are often on the leading edge as well of sustainable cooling. Um, challenges and interventions. So there's consideration now of um, an opportunity for cities to become partners to this global cooling pledge through the following potential two, um, two sort of uh, uh, commitment areas. So for subnational governments, be they cities or, or other subnationals, the idea is that they could commit to at least one of the following and be, and, and by doing this show that they're committing and supporting to the global cooling pledge. One is the adoption of a jurisdictional heat action plan. It's been shown that these save lives, um, early warning systems, good communication systems, um, and training um, for um, municipal officials as well as health practitioners in particular can be really, really um, important in a heat wave. 
and then to increase or enhance the proportion of nature-based solutions uh, within built-up surface area by 2030. So we're asking on the nature-based solutions piece, we're asking for federal governments or national governments to show cities that they're gonna be supportive, and then we're asking cities to reciprocate that. So this is a bit of a brief overview. Um, I hope it's, it's provided sufficient context, but I think now what we'd like to do is transition to uh, the next uh, the panel discussion and where we can hear some examples of, of global cooling leadership. So with that, um, I think our, our panelists are, are out there and I'd like to invite them to the, to the stage at this point so we can begin the panel discussion. Please, and I'll introduce you as you come. <laughs> So we have Mr. Ali Majid, who's the Deputy Minister, Environment, Climate, and Technology for the Government of the Maldives. We're also joined by Silia Priti, who's an economist with the Ministry of Economy and Finance in the Government of Cambodia. Ms. Herlin Herlianika, who is the President of Ashray Indonesia Chapter. And Mr. Alex Aplatza, who wears many hats, but today is the Chief Executive Officer of the Philippine Energy Efficiency Alliance. Great. Okay. Hopefully, this is this is on. So. Thank you again to our panelists for joining us. I think uh, it's, it's going to be great to hear about your experience and your sort of uh, leadership that you've witnessed and seen and understand from the countries where you're coming from. And I don't want to sort of waste too much time, and I think I'll, I'll get right into it with the first question, which is for uh, Deputy Minister Majid um, of the Maldives. Could you you know, briefly describe the important steps the Maldives have taken in recent years to show leadership on sustainable cooling internationally and speak about why you think it might be important for other countries to do the same? Um, thank you very much, Ben, <coughs> for having us here and giving some uh, information about what we are doing on uh, championing on the uh, cooling <coughs> Uh, about the reducing the HCFC and the uh, challenges we face to global warming. Uh, Maldives has always been exemplary of fulfilling the obligation of uh, Montreal Protocol. We are one of the first countries to phase out CFCs two years ahead of the schedule. Back in 2008. At the beginning of the past decades, we have phasing out HCFC was part of the carbon neutral policy. When this work start back in 2010, our plan was to become carbon neutral by 2020. And the idea was that we also phase out HCFC by 2020. Our target initially was to reach this goal by 2030, but we want to bring it a little bit more forward on this. Our goal was to align the dual goal of ozone layer protection and reduction, the negative impact of climate change. We have able to complete the phase down of HCFC in 2020. This is 10 years ahead of timeline set by Montreal Protocol. Under the Montreal Protocol as an Article 5 co country, Maldives is set the beginning of the phase down of HCFCs in 2024. Prepare for the phase down of HCFC, Maldives says. different project with aid of UNEP and Kigali enabling activities has concluded while we are preparing preparation for Kigali implementation plan is currently ongoing. Under the Kigali enabling activities project, we develop a country assessment report to identify the gaps in 
the policy and legislative framework. Now the bill has been drafted and uh, approved by the Ministry of Environment. And also currently we are being reviewed by follow the legislative process for the final approvals. We hope we would be address the legal gaps and implementation activities under the Montreal Protocol as of the current plan, the bill will be approved, hopefully end of 2023. This will start the CFC phase down. We are <coughs> also, we are currently working on preparation of Kigali implementation plan and under this project, we are developing a strategic action plan for HCFC phase down. This will again enable us to identify and propose the required investment policy and technical assistance interventions for achieving the sustainable HCFC consumption reduction. Um, also, we are developing a certification and licensing program for refrigeration and air conditioning technicians. The program would also ensure that the technicians are trained and informed about the best practice and the latest technologies available for them to use in the industry. This would lead to reduction in leakage of refrigerant and better efficiency of equipment through the proper maintenance. Uh, also, we, we have um, introduced a program called Hakatari, which is uh, um, a local name, which is Star Labeling Program. That is standard and labeling program was launched in uh, September 20, 2021. The program was initially launched as a voluntary program for two years and will become mandatory in 2024. This program would help consumers in choosing energy efficiency products and provide understanding on energy saving by selecting energy efficient products. With the success of implementation of this program by 2032, it will expect that this program will reduce energy consumption by, we are expecting 16% with an overall greenhouse gas reduction of approximately 1.02 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Also additional generating capacity of 147 megawatts will avoided, which would save about 51.9 million USD from the government fuel budget. Additionally, this would also save 91 million liters of oil by 2032. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think um, what I had, what I remember is that Maldives became the first developing country to quit HCFCs. And I think that's pretty remarkable and a testament to your um, your leadership on the subject. Um, before we move to the next question um, for uh, Celia, I just one note from the technical team, just if we can speak close to the microphones <laughs> uh, when we can, um, so that the the recording can pick up the the answers. So now I'll move to Tsileyap, who's with the government of Cambodia. Can you, uh, could you tell us, in your own view, why access to cooling, why access to sustainable cooling is important for the people of Cambodia, and why it was important for the government to draft a comprehensive national cooling action plan that we heard about um, in the earlier presentation? Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for the question. Um, and thank you for having me here today as well. Um, I'm happy to see that the Cambodian National Cooling Action Plan, or the NCAP as we like to call it, being recognized for 
a comprehensive example as a regional leadership. Um, before I answer your question, though, I would like to point out, too, that my view and what I'm about to answer is uh, the perspective of an economist, because I'm an economist. Um, I'm not an expert on the field, uh, so it does not reflect or represent the view of the government of Cambodia in any way. Um, yeah, so in Cambodia, because um, in Cambodia and as in um, most places, most countries in the world, heat is um, growing, extreme heat is growing, and as are our cooling needs. And it was I think it was important for the government of Cambodia uh, to develop the NCAP, to detail the measures, uh, to supply cooling services in order to protect the people from from the oh I think it's getting from the extreme heat and um, I think it's also a cross cutting issue. It's not it's not just about um, to protect the environment and to promote the climate resilience alone, but it's also to safeguard our power system and at the same time it also helps our economy grow and it also boosts the productivity of our business ecosystem as well. Um, in Cambodia, as the air conditioning needs are expanding, as so many places in the world as well, it is essential for, for the government to make um, efficient cooling solutions affordable for the people. And um, this will help ensure, of course, the sustainability of our, en of, of our energy system. Um, it can also unlock the econ economic savings and efficiency uh, for households and grow the economic uh, productivity as well. Um, also, at the same time, urbanization is growing and it's expanding rapidly in Cambodia, especially in the residential sector. Um, it's, it's important that, um, and it's, it's, all, it's also being outlined in the NCAP too, um, right? The passive design strategies to maintain uh, cooler buildings and, and urban spaces, as well as reducing the cooling-related electricity consumption and emissions. Um, I think overall, the NCAP uh, capitalizes on the benefits that sustainable cooling um, can deliver for, for the sustainable development goals and for progress against um, the impact of climate change as well. Um, the NCAP is, for me, it's a, it's a realization of a commitment that Cambodia makes in our NDC, um, as well as our long-term strategy for carbon neutrality. Um, moreover, the NCAP provides a, a foundation for accelerating actions to achieve climate mitigation and the adaptation targets across various sectors. Um, yeah, I think that's, the, and there are so many more, so many more reasons, so many more um, impacts that the NCAP offer to Cambodia as a country as well. And um, as a message, I also uh, encourage uh, countries, especially in our region, to follow this example, to take this example and um, support the Global Cooling Pledge championed by the um, COP presidency ahead of the COP28. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, and thanks very much for the uh, the words on the pledge and, and for the leadership that Cambodia has shown. I think uh, also it's it's many times useful to hear uh, um, for the perspective of an, of an economist. I'm also an economics person and uh, working around a lot of uh, engineers sometimes can intimidate me, but at times it's, uh, it's good to have that type of perspective brought to this issue. Um, so now I'm going to turn to um, Ms. Herlin Herlianika, who's the president of ASHRAE Indonesia chapter, um, to talk a little bit about um, Indonesia. Um, so the economy in Indonesia is growing very quickly with income growth, and, and with income growth and climate change, its cooling needs are also growing. I was wondering, can you tell us about the progress Indonesia is making uh, in managing energy demand growth for cooling? Uh, some of the policy improvements that we've seen in Indonesia and how cooling is being leveraged for economic and social benefits. Thank you. Um, 
thank you when the um, good afternoon uh, everybody and uh, thank you when for for inviting me here um this is a very very interesting question actually uh, like one question but it is exactly a lot of question from you, from you yeah uh, the answer uh, right uh, according to clubs uh, and use uh, residential uh, survey uh, cooling appliances is uh, responsible almost 40 percent of electricity consuming uh, from residential in 2019 and uh, res residential energy consumption is uh, about 47 percent of the national cooling demand eh, energy demand so it's like cooling sector will will consume something uh, 16 percent of uh, national uh, energy demand uh, Indonesia is current in the right track I think to to manage the energy um, energy demand in cooling through the maps of split AC uh, it is released already since 2015 uh, 2015 uh, at the time uh, our maps level is very low but now it is already on the track following the uh, ASEAN harmonization. Uh, even though for 2000, uh, the next step, uh, the next stage, we will have um, difficulties following this um, ASEAN harmonization because when we go to uh, to life cycle cost analysis in Indonesia, we will have uh, a bit um, difficult condition because the inverter, if we want to transform the market to inverter, the price of inverter technology in Indonesia will be double everywhere, I think, yeah. Uh, but energy price is um, quite still low. So when we want to make approach on the saving cost in this uh, market transformation, it is not the right way to approach the market because uh, the life cycle cost analysis, we will get the payback period more than five years. So it is not uh, a good approach for, for the market. So uh, somehow, um, Indonesia still try uh, seriously on the following this um, this leadership to follow the higher um, maps level. Yeah, we do the study uh, roadmap the technology how to how to support the produ uh, producers to get the um, comprehensive um, comprehensive analysis about the about the market price and etc. We also make a platform, a platform, community platform that will um, advise uh, the government for the more stringent uh, energy, minimum energy performance for split AC. Um, and uh, more than that, Indonesia now will be expand the, uh, the maps to um, appliance uh, fan and refrigerator already already uh, regulate uh, since 2000, 2020, 21, 21, and then we will expand. Indonesia will expand in the to the chillers and the beverage cooler in a certain capacity. Uh, but maybe for chillers, uh, we will not only go to the maps only, but also uh, we do, we develop the guideline for commissioning and retro commissioning because chiller needs to always um, consider the chiller plan, not only from the chiller side. Yeah, uh, so Indonesian government uh, already make a lot of effort on chiller side because we know that the, in the chiller, uh, chiller will consume uh, more than 50% of uh, building energy 
uh, consumption. Uh, and in the, in the building sector also, Indonesia already um, regulate, uh, make a policy that all the building has, uh, has to have uh, energy, um, energy manager, energy manager and has to uh, make an audit and report it to the Minister of Energy every year. And they have to show uh, their effort to to um, uh, to decrease the energy consumption, and uh, this effort also uh, adding uh, by the the new regulation from Ministry of Public Work that Indonesia already have a building code, green building code. Uh, of course, uh, uh, under the building code, it is including the energy efficiency, uh, but yet it is still under the passive design from because it is from uh, Ministry of Public Work. Yet, uh, in the in the passive design, uh, uh, this this policy still using the conservative parameters for the passive design, like. Um, for parameters uh, in the comfort uh, condition in the building, it is still using 25 and 60% uh, of the condition, 60% uh, humidity. Uh, but some experts still uh, proposing to, to change this parameter to be the variable parameter so we can increase the, um, the temperature um, following with the um, variable of uh, humidity in the energy uh, in the building code how to how to make a passive design on the building um, that's from the building uh, and then because uh, I'm also involved with the uh, UNS Cup supporting Indonesia uh, developing NCAP now Indonesia in the uh, finalizing step on the report uh, so we hope in the next couple of months, uh, Indonesia can also release the NCAP report uh, after Cambodia, I think. I think So from this report, um, we know that the cold change, uh, cold change policy is not there yet as mandatory, but uh, every ministry, because uh, as uh, our our previous um, panelists already said that uh, cooling is everywhere, yeah. And then in the cold chains also is everywhere in uh, some of ministries in ministries of fishery because uh, uh, it is about the cold chains of fish. Uh, and then the ministry of Agri agriculture also a uh, lot of uh, agriculture product. And we found that um, cold chain is not that is not there yet. And we found that uh, agriculture waste is more than twenty five percent right now because of lack of cold chain uh, te uh, technology apply on that cold chain in Indonesia. But yet uh, we don't have any grand design yet. But every ministry already put the technical guideline, uh, even though that guideline still using conservative parameters. Yeah, conservative parameters like um, for fishery, it should be um, minus 40, something like minus 40, but we know that minus uh, 20 is already enough to put the fish uh, still fresh after six months. But still in the government guidelines, it is mentioned that it should be uh, minus 40 percent so you can imagine we have to use uh, bigger compressors and bigger energy consumption for that machine yeah so we are uh, trying uh, Indonesia will show that uh, we are in the in that uh, leadership to always uh, to always manage the uh, energy demand on the cooling uh, it is from cold chains and from healthcare uh, after COVID, we know that everybody always say that we we need uh, more fresh air. Yeah, we need more fresh air. But can you imagine if we need fresh air in the humid tropical country like Indonesia? 
if we we will took uh, fresh air from outside, uh, let's say 20% of the intake of the uh, air, we have to uh, cool the the air and also have to remove the humidity. So the energy demand from that on that uh, only that fresh air will be in increase the chiller uh, energy uh, like. 30%. Yeah, can you imagine that? So, um, putting fresh air as a, as a mandatory also will give Indonesia a bigger energy demand for cooling. So, we have to uh, think about filter, uh, fil uh, yeah, filtering on the, on the how, to, how to manage the uh, indoor air quality. In healthcare, also we it is not about uh, vaccine. It is about fresh air. It is about how to manage the clean room, etc. So, uh, from most of the uh, energy audit report in Indonesia, usually consultants still put the chiller 30% more than uh, the capacity needed by the building. Yeah. And you can imagine if we only talk about the new buildings, building codes for new building, we have a lot of stock there, much, much more than the new buildings. New buildings only 5%, but stock with all chiller, with chiller that bigger than, bigger, 30% uh, bigger capacity than it needed, yeah. And uh, we found also the chiller, uh, Maybe. Sorry, could you mind uh, um, maybe another 30 seconds just in the interest of time? We will okay. get through uh, okay, then. two rounds. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is for he healthcare and the building, for mobile air conditioning. Uh, we don't have any problem because uh, Indonesia don't produce a um, um, vehicle. It is uh, follow the original country. Uh, the, more, uh, the interesting one in Indonesia is data center because data center just uh, a new issue in Indonesia uh, uh, on our last month, uh, last two months uh, seminar uh, workshop with uh, DOE of U the US. It is found that the demand of energy by the data cooling in the data center is just the same as the energy reduction that targeted by Indonesia. <laughs> so it is not not yet calculate on the Indonesia NZA. So it is surprising for Indonesia, we have to manage how the energy demand from cooling in data center should supply by the renewable energy. Maybe that's all from uh, Indonesia side. Yeah. Mm. A lot more uh, <laughs> we, we want to share, but uh, you, can, you can see from the Indonesia NCAP report uh, in the last couple of months. Yeah. Thanks yeah, so yeah. much. Yeah, and yeah. sorry to sorry to stop you. That sounds like a, it was a very very substantial review, and uh, certainly looking forward to the possibility of the NCAP coming up from Indonesia this year. That would be great. And I should note also, Kenya released an NCAP yesterday. So uh, for those of you who are followers of that the, of the region, uh, something to check out. Um, I do want to turn now to uh, Alex Sablatza, um, uh to give us a perspective from Philippines. He's the CEO of the Philippine Energy Efficiency Alliance. Um, Alex, wondering if you can share your views on how the current policy and market conditions in the Philippines align with the commitments proposed in the Global Cooling Pledge. Where do you think the Philippines could make aligned commitments? Well, the Cooling Pledge commitments of the Philippines can potentially ride on very new energy efficiency legislation, which uh, my organization, PE2, pushed through a 29-year gap where we had no mandatory regime. So before that, we were one of the first in ASEAN to have an Enercon law. Then it lapsed in 1990. Then the next 29 years, we were back to voluntary. But now we have mandatory. So what this new law says, it, it's comprehensive and inclusive. Comprehensive because it's got MIPS. It, it creates a very powerful interagency where nine cabinet ministers uh, make government-wide and remove silos in, in transforming the energy efficiency market. 
And one of the resolutions there uh, that I was, I was discussing in the hallway was uh, it's a mandatory phase out of fixed speed air conditioning uh, in all government buildings uh, within a five year period. And, and that, that the clock started ticking like two years ago. And, and so there are many pronouncements in, in, in that regard. And then it creates fiscal incentives. And also why it's so inclusive, not only does it strengthen the, the MEPs, the standards labeling, the ESCO, the certified energy managers, certified, certified energy auditors, it also brings down obligations to the small energy users. You know, in the rest of ASEAN, the energy efficiency obligations are still, the consumption threshold is still very high. In Singapore, it's 54 terajoules. In Indonesia, it's still 6,000 tons of oil equivalent, although there are plans to bring it down to 4,000, but that hasn't materialized. In the Philippines, it's down to 500,000 kilowatt hours a year in fuel and electricity. And if you want to imagine how, how that is, that's like a standalone quick service restaurant or that is a 2,500 square meter daytime office space. Uh, half that size, 1,200, if that's a 24 hour BPO facility, right? So it's, it's not, it's, it's a small business now inheriting a long list of obligations of targeted reductions, such as energy intensity or specific energy consumption. So for example, if it's a commercial building, my cooling, cost of my cooling load per square meter should now be reduced in the next five years to this much. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really driving a lot of, uh, uh, generating a lot of demand for technology, solutions, services, innovative capital, uh, development resources uh, into the market because it's now very inclusive. Uh, you got small businesses and even very large households captured by that very low consumption threshold. So, and then for those under that 500,000, by the way, the Department of Energy in the Philippines is even thinking this year to bring it down further down to 100,000 to capture more of the, the, um, the, the smaller energy and users. It also, uh, it, uh, it, also so it also dangles incentives and it also whacks a big stick. You change behavior because there are penal provisions in the law. And under the renewable energy law, if I don't put up rooftop solar, I don't go to jail. But in the energy efficiency law, what people don't realize is that if I violate any of the conditions of the law, I face up to $2 million in fines to an individual or up to five years imprisonment. So there's, there's, they're whacking a big stick to change human behavior. Energy efficiency is about changing behavior and the rest will just have to connect, like technology, solutions, services, and capital, right? So it's, it's, if you want to transform a cooling market, ride on very tough legislation, such as the, the law that I just described. So that's, that, that's the situation in the Philippines. It's, it's, it puts it in a much better position to, to make such commitments uh, if I were the government. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> the, the the stick approach. I hadn't uh, sort of fully uh, grasped how big of a you know, big of a stick it might actually be. So that's very very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we're going to move on to the second round of questions for our panelists now um, on sort of galvanizing support uh, for sustainable cooling as we move into the second half of this year. And I'd like to uh, start with Tuleyap, if that's okay, um, from the government of Cambodia. What, uh, in your view, um, and this is a question sort of on investment and financing needs. So what, in, in your view, what investment and financing would be beneficial in Cambodia to kickstart the implementation of the National Cooling Action Plan? What do you see as being needed? Hmm. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, due to our time constraint, I'm just going to try to keep this really quick. Sorry, let me clarify. Uh, we do, please, please go ahead. We do have uh, about 20 minutes. Oh, That's okay. Fine. Yeah. Oh. That's good. I'll keep time. <laughs> um, so as I noted previously as well, um, investment in sustainable cooling in Cambodia has the, it has the potential to improve the economic productivity of key sectors in Cambodia, namely agriculture, um, fisheries, and tourism, etc. cetera. Um, but this will require substantial investment. And um, I think the first step that is outlined in the in the cooling plan too is to uh, create market enablers and financial delivery mechanisms. 
uh, this is a crucial first step, I think, to bringing in more investment. And um, anyway, but that also requires that uh, concessional finance and grants be made available to support the feasibility studies and also the, the first steps in developing the nascent market for energy efficiency, uh, energy efficient and climate friendly cooling as well. I say grants because uh, I have to be careful with what I say. Um, <laughs> we prefer grants because uh, if you ask Cambodian people, I think most people would likely say the same thing that we don't really pollute the world enough to borrow money to clean up the environment. So um, actually our pollution, our pollution rate is really low. So we tend to look for grants instead of uh, loans, if you may. Um, I think uh, we also, that said, we also need to work closely with the private sector as well because uh, um, we need to mobilize that capital uh, to innovate the cooling sector because uh, innovation in cooling is growing rapidly. Uh, so we need, we definitely need stronger collaboration uh, on financing, on business models that make efficient solution affordable for our people. Overall, I think uh, the message that we're trying to send with the NCAP is that Cambodia is ready to move forward on actions for cooling sector um, with a comprehensive framework, of course. And we welcome the opportunity to work with partners to facilitate investment as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I think you know the the point about grants is especially uh, important to to note at a time when you know public balance sheets are fairly constrained as a result of the pandemic as well. But uh, you know we've heard a little bit on this on the the topic of financing and and how there in there is money available. We just have to figure out how to channel it to where it needs to go. Um, and for me, that's one of the central challenges, both re with respect to implementing a, you know a national cooling action plan, but to leveraging the the big dollars that we need for investments in this sector over the next few years. Um, so thank you for your answer. Really appreciate it. I'm going to go uh, now back to the deputy, deputy minister, um, deputy minister Majid, to ask a little bit about uh, what he's looking, what he would look out for uh, ahead to COP28 and the and the global cooling pledge. So, so deputy minister, um, you know Maldives is is recognized for its climate leadership on important issues and has been over the years. Uh, looking ahead to this COP and thinking about the global cooling pledge, what outcomes do you think would be most useful from the global cooling pledge? to accelerate action and investment in sustainable cooling. Please. Uh, thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Actually, um, uh, Maldives is such a very small country compared to other nations, and we are very low-lying and um, environmentally vulnerable. And we are the country will first affect when some uh, a disaster happened, or a catastrophic disaster happened in the world, like tsunami, <coughs> we will be washed away. So we are in a brink of death in terms of climate. So <coughs> we also producing greenhouse gas, um, our contribution will about 0.003%. But uh, even though we are not um, producing that, that much that um, greenhouse gas um, to um, environment, and we are in separately very quietly um, living in like uh, 1,100 islands in the South Asia. But we have to raise our voice about the global warming because, as I said, as I mentioned, that we we are very vulnerable to the climate changes. So sustainable cooling is very vital part of the global cooling pledge, and encourages us to efficient, environment-friendly cooling.
cooling solutions. Implementing <coughs> a sustainable cooling in the nation, N nations uh, or governments adopting uh, better procurement plans to opt for the high efficiency cooling technologies can even enable to convert a considerable percentage of equipments in use. And <clears throat> also developing and in implementing a national, national cooling action plan will help Maldives to integrate a comprehensive actions to reduce energy related emissions. With the global cooling pledge, we hope to see an increasing related financial aids for countries to develop a comprehensive practical NCAP. That is a very <coughs> crucial for, for the countries uh, for the countries such as Maldives. And also involving encouraging and private sector in supporting the global cooling emissions, reduction and increase access <clears throat> access to the sustainable cooling is important in achieving the global cooling pledge targets. In the country in in the country assessment report done under the enabling activities for the Kigali amendments, it was found that 70% of RAC equipments used in the Maldives are air conditioners. For offices and households, cooling equipments. As it is an expected, the number will keep rising even in future due to the extreme high percentage of, high rate of global warming. Our climate's getting warmer day by day and we have to use the equipments, more equipments and more air, um, air conditioners to cool down our environment. And also, simultaneously, we are again putting our environment on, um, what would I say, it's like because of the global warming, we are cooling by using HFC and CFCs. And again, we are making our environment more warmer. Again, we have to use it more. So it's like uh, something like a destructive cycle ongoing. So we have to have a proper sustainable solution for this, uh, to break the cycle. And <clears throat> As it is an expected number will keep rising due to climate getting warmer, we have to find out a better technologies available in the markets. In Maldives, we have introduced the MEPS and Energy Efficiency Standards and Labeling Program, as I mentioned before, in 2021. The program is, is in voluntary phase, even though the RAC equipment importers are already onboarded. We have signed uh, several MOUs with the importers and we are keep conducting the uh, awareness workshops throughout the nation. And we have recently launched a national campaign for the energy efficiency, which is uh, mostly focused on the uh, cooling sector and related to other other uh, lighting and, and the washing machines and other um, energy efficiency uh, to um, use and adopt um, to every other people to use energy efficient household appliances. Uh, so the uh, since uh, these importers are on board, we have also provide, provided easier 
financial plans for the banks for consumers to purchase higher rate RSE equipment. These programs have proved to us that by providing, enabling the private sector to adopt the promote sustainable cooling, we will be able to achieve the global cooling place that will be committing. We, the government is uh, currently negotiating with some uh, banks to make uh, availability of uh, uh, installment basis plan for uh, purchasing uh, energy efficient equipments for paying for the long term basis like 36 months, 24 months. So which is, uh, which we are planning, that is uh, only for the energy efficient air conditions and other equipments. That's all, thank you. Fantastic, thank you for your, uh, very much for your insights. I mean, a, a couple things, I mean, uh, I think financing, I, I agree, I think seeing more finance flow through this process would be very useful and I think that's why the MLF is, is highlighted in the, uh, in the Global Cooling Pledge. Also the role of the private sector, as you know, um, it, we're not sort of explicitly discussing the role of the private sector here today, but certainly they have a role in ensuring that technologies that are best in class get to market and are um, affordable at point of purchase. And then on the, 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 cir the, the cycle, the, the degrading cycle, I mean, I think you're right. And I think our challenge is to turn that into a more virtuous circle where uh, sort of a systems level approach to sustainable cooling enables that uh, reduction in, in energy demand needed for it, but it also enables the health uh, and social benefits that come with it through livable neighborhoods, better air quality, and, and other benefits. But not to dwell on, because we've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to go back to our other <laughs> uh, two panelists. I'll, I'll start with, with, with Alex uh, now, if that's okay. Um, cooling needs in the fi here in the, in the Philippines and in the region are, are growing and may, have sig may place significant challenges on energy systems in the future. You know, you've had a lot of experience in this. Can you, can you give us some examples of innovative approaches to financing cooling uh, that can help improve energy efficiency and, and cooling and ultimately manage energy, energy demand growth? The, the world needs to mobilize $24.5 trillion in energy efficiency investments, and a, l a large portion of that, I believe, will be in cooling. Uh, the Philippines, in particular, will need to mobilize $243 billion through 2040, and uh, again, a huge portion of that will be in cooling technology solutions services. Two-thirds of the 243, or roughly $160 billion, will have to flow through innovative financial modalities, through new mechanisms. And uh, why the law, the new law that I spoke about will enable this is, is uh, number one, it will allow uh, government procurement of ESCO performance contracts, which was very difficult uh, under the previous budgeting rules where all forms of savings, including energy savings, will have to revert back to Treasury. And the e government cannot commit beyond the term of the current administration in each elective cycle. So there were so many barriers. And then second was to, um, to allow uh, PPP uh, transactions, public-private partnership transactions for large scale. So in other words, we were trying to mobilize private capital and know-how in public sector energy efficiency projects. And, and I, I was involved in the design of the, one of Asia's first PPP for energy efficiency. This was in the state of Malacca in, 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 in Malaysia. And we're trying to replicate that. Under the law, in the Philippines, we're trying to replicate that. Still early days, but how to design a PPP structure for large scale, let's say, public building, cooling and lighting uh, re replacement uh, program. And, and the third would be large scale government programs. You know, I, I was once part of uh, not only ADB, but uh, IFC, the World Bank. And I was trying to see how we could replicate. I designed for ADB uh, a lot of large scale lighting replacement programs. So in India, in Pakistan, in Vietnam, in Nepal, in the Philippines, we did that with the Department of Energy. Um, and how do, we, how do we do this for larger, let's say, cooling appliances? 
Um, and you know, the World Bank at some point assisted Mexico in a refrigerator and window type air conditioner replacement program. So I said, hmm, maybe we can learn from the mistakes, but also learn from the strikes of the Mexico program and do large scale. You know what the world is not doing effectively? It's to finance forced obsolescence of older technologies. Forced obsolescence is still largely policy driven, but if you want to further accelerate it, collect it, uh, collect the old technologies and make sure that the end users have access to, to um, the, the, the better, better refrigerants and, and more energy efficient uh, technologies. So it's, it's, uh, it's bulk procurement, uh, it, but it's also forced obsolescence how to finance that. And that could be done through the PPP structure, that could be done through large-scale government retrofit programs, that could be done through uh, ESCOA performance contracts, which are now all enabled under the new law I described earlier. Uh, I also like to add that the Philippines is home to the world's first privately owned super ESCO, which is called the uh, Climergy. And the second was in Canada. So it's, it's it's, uh, it's exciting days for, for off-balance sheet uh, capital flows for, for energy efficiency and cooling. I can finally here <laughs> take some credit for Canada. <laughs> you don't hear Canada come up too often in cooling conversations, but that's good to know. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for that insight. I think that's, that's a potentially big amount of money, so much appreciated. So I'll, I'll go now to Herlin uh, for the last question of the second of the, second of the last round, um, and then we'll, we'll close out the session. Uh, sort of similar similar tone here. You you have extensive experience working on cooling and energy efficiency policy in the region. Um, considering sort of the opportunity ahead, how do you think we can use the momentum gained by the UAE's championship of sustainable cooling and the pledge to accelerate policy progress in the in the Asia and the Pacific region? Uh, thank you. Uh yeah, it is. It is very, very interesting actually. If Indonesia uh, could uh, actively uh, follow this pledge, yeah, uh, there is a representative from our government, Ministry of Energy. So let's uh, let's support that pledge of Indonesia because we we have a lot of opportunity to to uh, have energy efficiency for, from cooling sector. Yeah, like uh, I mentioned before, Indonesia has a big, uh, a big emission reduction opportunity from from this cooling sector. If you, if you follow, if we, Indonesia follow this place, uh, and we can get a lot of uh, support for for investment. I, I mean, for for ESCO, uh, for ESCO scheme, for a lot of uh, technology transfer and. Uh, capacity building that will be that will be very good for Indonesia because we see that big opportunity in Indonesia, big population, the big country in the tropical humid country. Uh, we need to follow that pledge. Yeah, thank you. Maybe uh, that's all from from my side. Yeah, as a president of ASRE, because ASRE should al always advise. Uh, the community, the government for a sustainable technology. Perfect. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. And thanks for your kind words and support of the, the pledge as president of ASHRAE. Um, so we have come up on time uh, for the session. I think we had sort of hoped um, we might get a little bit of time for a, a bit of a back and forth on the pledge in. But um, instead, I would just try to conclude very briefly with the following, um, the following thoughts. We've heard about innovation, we've heard about interesting and innovative methods of financing sustainable cooling, and we've heard about policy progress. These are all sort of central components to this global cooling pledge. And through it, there should be hopefully opportunity for a wide variety of countries to make commitments to the pledge and to demonstrate new ambition on sustainable cooling. It's not um, every year that you will have uh, a COP presidency sort of back you on, on an issue. And you know, I think I can speak on behalf of, of UNEP and the Cool Coalition Secretariat, hopefully, I'm from SE for All, um, in saying that, that it would behoove us to try and seize this moment for those of us who are sort of working on this issue and try to push uh, as much as we can. So 
Uh, to the, the, those of you working in government in the room, uh, I would just say, you know, please do consider uh, the pledge when it comes out in July. Um, and you'll see other events such as these coming up over the, over the summer and fall to sort of uh, um, socialize the pledge and understand uh, uh, the goods and the bads about it. But, you know, please do stay tuned. Um, your leadership and your commitment is what's going to make this work. Second, if you're supporting governments, uh, please you know, advocate on its behalf as we get closer to COP. And third, I think think about how um, this pledge can be used to leverage more resources into sustainable cooling, at least on the public side. You know, we know that, that the private sector is, is going to be the bulk of the finance to, uh, to uh, um, address this issue. But there's a really important role for public finance, and I think we can help um, catalyze not necessarily more finance because we know where, where it is, but channel it towards the implementation of commitments through this pledge. So I would just end with that sort of light challenge. <laughs> um, and with that, uh, can you please join me in a round of applause to thank our panelists for participating today? I'd also like to thank uh, the Asian Development Bank and the UK Department for uh, Energy Security and Net Zero, as well as the Cool Coalition for their support in organizing this session. And I hope it was insightful. Thank you to those who stuck with us for the afternoon. Thank you very much.